Welcome to Salute Your Sports Week 23, Common Enchev, Tom Castleman, Drew Brackett. We've got a big show today, March Madness Breakdown. Uh, we'll give you our insights on our brackets, Final Four, uh, championship picks. If you guys have been watching the show over the last few months, uh, the teams I've been picking all year, I'm still going to be picking them today, uh, guys. Um, week 23, 23, Michael Jordan, number 23, it's perfect time to talk basketball, of course, his legend grew when he hit the game-winning shot as a freshman in 1982 to beat Georgetown and uh, Patrick Ewing, so big, big show, guys, um, before we get into the field, was there anyone that you felt was snubbed, anything out of the ordinary with the selection committee this year? Yeah, for me, looking at the teams that are uh, the first four uh, out and last four out, um, I didn't really see anything that I thought was really super egregious. I thought that there were actually a few more snubs uh, within the bracket than there were uh, outside of the bracket. Uh, For one, I'm going local here in Chicago. I think Loyola got snubbed with the seating that they had, uh, ranked 17th in the country, I believe, off the latest uh, poll that came out. And, uh, you know, if you look at different efficiency ratings like Ken Palm, they're one of the best teams in the country, uh, won the regular season and tourney title for the uh, Missouri Valley Conference. And yet uh, they're seated on the 8-9 line, which is about, you know, 12 spots lower than what uh, what they were ranked in uh, the coach ranking. So I thought they got snubbed a little bit. They're having a tough draw, uh, certainly with Georgia Tech. And then they followed that right up with in-state rival uh, Illinois. So I think the community, uh, the the committee decided to have a little bit of uh, a little bit of humor, a little bit of um, you know storylines. They say that they don't schedule teams for that, but uh, you know Oklahoma State could also potentially meet up with Illinois, and uh, Brad Underwood uh, used to coach at Oklahoma State, now is at Illinois. So the committee says they're not big on storylines, but I thought that was a pretty big snub. Um, and then I actually thought Alabama got snubbed a little bit. I thought that in winning the SEC regular season and tourney title, they had the bona fides to be a number one seed against a Michigan team that, yes, uh, by percentage points, won the Big Ten regular season, uh, but kind of sputtered towards the end, didn't do all that well in the tournament. Granted, they have an injured player, but I thought Alabama did enough to maybe move up onto that one line, um, but certainly a potential interesting matchup in the Elite Eight between the Wolverines and the Crimson Tide. Yeah, I'm going kind of the same route you're going with, Tom. I like the field. I think they got the field right. I mean, there's always going to be someone that will write one way or another. I think Louisville is one of those teams. But ultimately, I think they got the field right, uh, but they did screw up the seeding a little bit. I agree with you about Loyola, probably higher than an eight seed. And also, they got a very tough draw in Georgia Tech. That might be the toughest game I have to pick in my entire bracket. And right now, I have Georgia Tech actually beating Loyola. I might change that, though. I'm very unsure about that 8-9 game. I talk about storylines. Our alma mater, Mizzou, going up against Oklahoma, former Big 12 rival, in another good 8-9 game. <laughs> and that's the... There it that, is. We had as students uh, in college, actually, when Mizzou upset number one Oklahoma uh, in the BCS. That was Drew and I's sophomore year, I think Tom's freshman year. Mm-hmm. I did the... Broadcast play by play for KCOU, the longest post game show ever because no one wanted to produce the broadcast. Uh, someone else was supposed to turn us off. They never did. They rushed the field. Drew heard the post game show on the radio, came to the rescue about one hour into a two man post game show <laughs> with no breaks. It was, it was a <laughs> brutality. So, did not you were on the air for like five hours straight. Yeah, it was <laughs> literally it was a five-hour broadcast because we couldn't take any breaks because we didn't have a producer. So we went in early to do a pregame show. It was like a three-and-a-half-hour game. We did like at least a 30-minute pregame show, at least an hour postgame show, literally a five-hour broadcast for two college students. It was, <laughs> it was something else. Um for the record, I don't think Mizzou's going to have that same magic against Oklahoma. Uh, every time I pick Mizzou to win, they lose. So I'm going to pick Mizzou to lose. Maybe they'll win this way in, in, in their first game. Uh, but I'm just 
I'm just glad that they likely won't have to play Nor Norfolk State in this tournament. Yeah, they might choke. Mizzou last won a tournament game in 2010, my freshman year, as a 10 seed against Clemson, who was a 7 seed. And then a couple years later, number 2 seed losing to a 15 seed Norfolk State. I think they're pronounced like Norfolk. I think it's the proper way to pronounce it. That's, that's correct. You're correct. But it sounds too close to a swear word, so I better, I better be careful. But um, anywho, uh, getting into the bracket, Tom, I agree on. I, I have a, uh, I, I do actually have a, uh, a snub. Uh, I, where, where are the Belmont Bruins in this thing? The Ohio Valley Conference. They went 26 and four this season. I mean, shoot, they played 30 games. Uh, they lost in the title game to Moorhead State, a great team. But I think Belmont should have gotten at least a, a look in the uh, at-large bids. Yeah, yeah, they weren't even listed as one of the potential replacement teams, something that I think the deadline's passed and no teams have withdrawn from the NCAA tournament. Um, but we had four teams. I think it was Louisville, uh, Colorado State, and there were a couple other teams. I think St. Ole Louis Miss. was one of them. And Ole Miss, Ole Miss and SLU, yep. Uh, those were the teams that were tabbed as replacement teams. If any teams had COVID issues and were not going to be able to join the tournament, Belmont wasn't even considered for that. I think that, you know, part of the issue was, you know, no quadrant one wins, uh, I think it is, for, for Belmont. Um, but this kind of goes back to what I was talking about last week with, you know, where's the, the love and the respect for the, the regular season conference winners, the teams that play really well all year and then happen to lose in their tourney game. Uh, I don't know if we'll have time to get into it today, but I do have an amended solution on that because uh, I was I was captivated by the magic of the conference tournaments this year and just everything that goes into it. So um, I'm, I'm I'm revisiting my position. Um, wow, it a revisit! Out, it squeezes I, out. I thought the arguments I laid out is what swayed you, but maybe it was just <laughs> no. It was it was witnessing the games, you know, unfold before me, and 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 the 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 magic that it comes with a team making a deep run like an Oregon State or a Georgetown, even at Madison Square Gardens with Patrick Ewing, you know, getting no respect from the staff there, yeah, um, you know, was. people not knowing who he is, while they certainly knew who he was leaving the building, so. I'm revisiting my position on on the the auto bids coming out of the conference tourney finals, but um, uh, yeah, I, I I do think that Belmont deserved more of a, a fair shake to to make the tournament as an at large bid. Real quickly, before Drew Brackett cut me off, I was going to tell you that I had a major issue with the seating. Uh, I agree about Loyola, Alabama. I disagree with you. I think Alabama is a solid number two. Uh, I don't think they're as good as Michigan or Illinois. Uh, SEC much weaker conference uh, mm -hmm. than the Ten, so I had no griping with uh, their seed. The team that got vastly underseeded by one, maybe two spots, even Joe Lenardi himself said they were underseeded, was Oklahoma State. Uh, mm -hmm. Oklahoma State was a four seed. Uh, West Virginia, by the way, was a three seed, and Oklahoma State beat them two out of three meetings in the regular season, including the last two. If you add up the conference, uh, and regular season that had more wins and a better win percentage in the Big 12 Conference. Also more total wins, a better total win percentage, 20 and 8 compared to 18 and 9 for West Virginia. Uh, Oklahoma State won 8 of their last 10 games. They also had a win over Baylor, who West Virginia lost to. Uh, made zero sense that Oklahoma State would be a 4 seed. Lenardi had them as a 3, maybe even a 2. So stay tuned to more about Oklahoma State, by the way. I have a lot to say about Cade Cunningham, the future number one pick in the NBA draft, perhaps a future Hall of Famer. Uh, that's how good this guy is. <laughs> Just one of, one of the things to keep in mind for the next hour or two and for the next 10 or 20 years, that's how good Cade Cunningham is. That's how good the Oklahoma State Cowboys are. But... Um, Certainly, they're sort of an underdog as a four seed, but not a major underdog. We'll get into some of our upset picks in the next segment. But first, Tom came up with this brilliant idea to kind of give people some tips into picking the brackets, some insights, at least what we like to do. Obviously, it's March Madness. You can have all these formulas and all these things, and then a random person wins the bracket who just fills out the colors they like and the numbers they like. So... 
Uh, but what what do you what do you what are your, what are some of the tips and uh, ideas you have, Tom? Yeah. So uh, first off, uh, there's a couple of varying sets of, of just general tips that you should have going into this. Uh, particularly if you're in a small pool, say, you know, 12 people, 10 people or fewer versus being in a larger pool. If you're in a small pool, feel free to go with heavy on the chalk, picking a lot of the higher seeded teams to advance because you're going to have some variance in there. Um, but what you don't want to do is try, you know, picking that trendy upset or, you know, everybody likes the glory of saying like, oh, I called this team to go this far. If you miss on that and there's an upset someplace else, you're missing out on a lot of value and putting yourself behind. If you're in a larger bracket pool, you do want to go heavier on those upsets because a lot of people are going to have Gonzaga. They are the clear betting favorite for the tournament. Um, everywhere I'm seeing, experts love Gonzaga being a, a Final Four team. So if you're in a larger bracket pool, maybe look to make some picks that are going to be a bit uh, a bit different. Maybe pick Iowa. Even if you think Gonzaga is going to beat Iowa, Maybe you pick Iowa just to be a little bit different so that if that does happen, your bracket actually moves closer to the top. So that's uh, you know a pretty big thing to consider. Um, in picking chalk, only one time in NCAA history have all four one seeds gone to the Final Four. That was in 2008. So as good as a lot of these teams look at the top of the bracket, be prepared to pick some teams that uh, you know could potentially surprise. It's going to be difficult to identify. I'll get some general tips from from you, Common and Drew, but uh, you know we'll get into that a little bit later too, and kind of identifying where you can find some mismatches along the way. Sure, I think one of the big things to remember, time we talk about four one seeds not making it, but at the same time, almost every year there's at least two that make it. So always pick minimum two one seeds. I think there's a stat in the last, uh, you know, twenty something like. 28 of the last 30, a one seed has won the tournament or has made the final game, something like that. So definitely want to pick two to three. My thinking is usually I pick three of them, knowing that at least two of them will make it, maybe the third doesn't. So that's what I have, by the way, three one seeds and not a one seed. We'll have that in a little bit. As far as upsets, uh, my favorite is when I picked Davidson as a 10 seed to make the Elite Eight in 2008. Certainly got that one right, Stephen Curry. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll have more on that later in the show. Uh, but uh, I would say be careful with the upsets. You want to pick one or two you really like, but some people get so upset heavy. The, the risk with it is there will be upsets, but if you pick the wrong 12 seed and the wrong 13 seed, you pick two 12 seeds and the opposite two 12 seeds make it, then you're in trouble. Keep in mind... Uh, We've never had a double-digit seed ever uh, make the championship game. I think we've had two double-digit seeds. Loyola and VCU, I believe, mm-hmm. are the only teams to make it as 11 seeds. And very rarely do double-digit seeds make it to the Elite Eight. Extremely rare. I think our Mizzou Tigers with Kareem Rush made it back in the day, I think, as a 12 seed. If I'm not mistaken, maybe it was 11. Uh, but nonetheless, when you look for those upsets, those 11 seeds, those 12 seeds, you can pick them to the Sweet 16, but don't get crazy. Do not pick them uh, past uh, to make the, the Elite Eight. A few things I personally like to do is I look for uh, what conferences perform well that year. It tells you a measure of who's going up, you know, who did you play. So I look at, look at teams from the Big 12 and the Big 10, by far the two best conferences. So I have a lot of Big 12 teams and a lot of Big 10 teams uh, making it to the Sweet 16 and further also, I like teams with good coaches to get it done in March. I look at 11 seeds like Michigan State and Syracuse. Two of my upsets, we'll get to that in a little bit, with Tom Izzo and Jim Beheim. Syracuse also uh, plays a little different style with the zone, something teams may not be used to. Uh, that, by the way, is the best upset to make in the first round. Even BPI has Syracuse as an 11 at like 40% chance to win. I look at teams uh, with depth like uh, Gonzaga and Baylor, a lot of balance. I look at good shooting. Again, Gonzaga and Baylor, they've got so many guys that can shoot the basketball. And it's March Madness. I look at who are the star players. Who is the Stephen Curry, the Dwayne Wade, the Carmelo Anthony, the Anthony Davis, the star player that can carry their team? Well, that's Kate Cunningham. More on that in a little bit. But, guys, uh, almost every year we have at least one double-digit seed make the Sweet 16, what team is going to do it this year? 
Well, I was going to say about the about the bracketology and you know picking the teams. You know, uh, I've I've seen like Jay Billis tweeting out the wins and loss records of different seeds. Like you know, the eight has won this many games against the nine, and of course, the sixteen seed has won one game against the one seed. So. You know, those are good references as well because you don't want to pick 16 seeds usually. It's only happened one time in the history of the tournament. 15, it, it's happened a couple times, um, but you just want to look at the percentages as well. Yeah, the 11 and 12 are the upsets to look for, sometimes the 13, but anytime you're looking at 14 to 16, very unlikely. And I think for me, it's, uh, you know, moving on to the, you know, talking about double-digit seeded teams to make it to the Sweet 16. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, in a year as crazy and as hectic as this one, I don't have a lot of confidence in picking any of these double-digit seeded teams to make it to the Sweet 16. Um, you know, I look at, you know, common you mentioned Syracuse is a pretty popular pick uh, as their path is San Diego State and then the winner of West Virginia and Moorhead State. So they certainly have a bit of an easier path, but I certainly don't feel uh, particularly trusting with uh, with them in that game. Um, I think with the winner of the UCLA-Michigan State matchup, uh, they probably have a pretty good chance of making a run, and it's a little bit of a misnomer to call them, uh, you know, like an underdog team or a Cinderella team because these are major conference teams that are doing the play-in game. Um, one thing to kind of tie in with some of the trends that we've seen in recent years, uh, I don't know exactly how many years the NCAA has been doing the play-in game. It's been less than 10, I'm pretty sure. Um, but usually the winner of the you know, 11 seed play-in game wins a couple of games and can advance. So I think that if I had to pick a team that's double-digit seeded to go to the Sweet 16, probably the winner of the UCLA-Michigan State game. You have two teams that are pretty talented, um, Michigan State played in a really, really rough conference and kind of came, you know, a little bit on the upswing towards the end. So I would say probably that's where I would look, but I don't know if I'm confident enough to pick that necessarily. It's just really, really difficult to pick a double-digit seed going two spots this year. Interesting. And, yeah. and real quick comment, it's interesting you say that because, you know, with the pandemic, I would think that there could be more double-digit seeds because we just don't know what could happen. I, I think it's going to be more chaotic this year. No, I think it is chaotic, but I'm saying I'm not confident in picking which one's going to be uh, which. Right, that's right, that's, that's where I'm, I'm drawing the line, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of times in recent years we see that mid-major that has a superstar player, and we kind of want to jump on them. Uh, and I think it's harder to pick in the sense that oftentimes some of the mid-major teams – have had less of a chance to play the Power Five teams because of the COVID season. So we don't really have as good of a feel for a team. Like I talked about Davidson in 2008. Well, that year Davidson barely lost to UNC the first game of the season. They also played like Duke and UCLA tough. So like they had sample size against good teams. Uh, but we don't really have some of these uh, lower conference teams, uh, mid-majors that have sort of the – uh, ability to have played those teams. So I agree with you, Tom. It's hard to pick it. And I also oddly agree with you. You're picking the right one. But I'm going to go ahead and make it more confidently. Because why not? Let's go for it. Let's be confident in what we're picking. So I think it's going to be Michigan State. It's going to beat UCLA. I, I think Michigan State is going to go ahead and beat BYU for sure. BYU, uh, one of the weakest six seeds in the history of the tournament. Uh, they... Uh, Beat San Diego State, which was a nice win, but basically they got a six seed because they were the second best team in the Mountain West. They lost three losses to Gonzaga. Oh my God, look, it's a good loss. Guess what? They lost all of them by double digits. So if you're looking at a near lock as a 6 11 game, I would definitely say um, BYU is falling against Michigan State or UCLA, two talented teams that underachieved this season and have a lot to prove in March. Uh, the second game is going to be a little tougher. Certainly Texas will be tough, but I'm going to say I'm going to stick with Michigan State because this team has proven as a lower seed to get it done in the tournament. I know their seed is a little bit lower this season, uh, but as a seven seed in 2015, they went all the way to the Final Four. Uh, I know it's different players, different teams, but it's Tom Izzo. He kind of gets his team to buy into that underdog role uh, also, uh, Final Four in 2010 is a five seed. 
Um, uh, Final Four in 2005 is, is a five seed as well. So every, every time that they're a lower five to seven seed, they seem to do well. This season they were an 11 seed, but Tommy talked about it. They played in the best conference in college mm-hmm. basketball, certainly the deepest. I think Big 12 might have better top-heavy teams, but depth-wise, Big 10 was the best. And guess what? What has happened in the last three to four weeks? Who has Michigan State beaten? They beat Michigan, who's a one seed. They beat Illinois, who's a one seed. And they beat Ohio State, who's a two seed. So you might look at their record and say they're barely above 500, but they beat some really good basketball teams. And they beat them recently. Tom Izzo said he was upset that Michigan State even had to play in the playing game. You better believe they're going to be fired up. Take the Spartans to make the Sweet 16. Michigan State is your double-digit team to look for. A couple other ones, though. Oregon State won the Pac-12. I don't think they're going to make the Sweet 16, but they might upset Tennessee, which is a very Mm -hmm. bipolar team. Uh, Look for that one. Uh, I don't think I'm picking it, but who was Villanova playing? Winthrop, uh, if we're looking Mm -hmm. mid-major, could pull a 12-5 upset. I think Syracuse I do have in my bracket. Uh, topping uh, San Diego State there, the sixth seed, um, and which is interesting because we've got a lot of like traditional powerhouse teams as 11, 12, like UCLA, Michigan State, uh, Syracuse. So we could have a few. There's going to be at least one. I don't know if we're going to hit it, but I'm definitely going uh, for um, Michigan State. Drew, who do you like out of the double-digit seeds? Yeah, it's tough. You know, I, I like UCLA, Michigan State. Um, you know, Drake, they have an injury, uh, an injured player. He may or may not be playing. That could be a big difference uh, against that game against Wichita State. But, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, UC Santa Barbara, I know, is popular pick. Winthrop is also popular. So you have the double-digit seeds that are popular picks. And, you know, just do your research and, you know, what do you value on a team and, make that determination and pick that team. Yeah, real quickly, I don't think it's going to happen, but Oral Roberts has a 15 seed, has one of the nation's leading scorers. I'm blanking on his name, but he he could light it up, shoot the basketball. Uh, So if you're looking for a 15 seed, look for Oral Roberts. uh, Who are they up against, Ohio State? Yeah, I mean, I'm not picking it. I've got Ohio State in the Elite Eight. (laughs) But if you want to get crazy – that's the 15 seed uh, to look for. Um, but what do you guys think in terms of which conference do you guys think will perform the best in this tournament? Well, I mean, on sheer volume, uh, the Big Ten is sending nine teams to the tournament. It's kind of difficult to not you know, look at them and, and pick them to, you know, to, a lot of them to win their first round matchup at the very least. You know, even a team like Rutgers, which isn't really traditionally a, a power basketball team, uh, I think they're currently favored against Clemson, a, a middling, a middling major. If we're going to, you know, kind of twist the phraseology a, a little bit there, uh, you know, I think Maryland has a tough matchup against UConn. Uh, I don't know if they'll advance out of that one, but look for, you know, they Illinois, will. Ohio State, Iowa. These are all, you know among the top eight teams in the country, and I'm looking for them to go far. Uh, Michigan, of course, is a one seed. I'm looking for them to go pretty far. Um, so I think it's it's a bit of a loaded question given just the volume of teams that are in the tournament, um, but they're also definitely, I think, the most talented. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing. I don't know. <laughs> Drew is undecided. Again, I'm going Big 12, Tom. Uh, You mentioned that the Big 10 has the most depth. They're probably going to have the most first-round wins. Uh, Big 12 has 17. Big 10 has 9 in the tournament. But I look at it, what teams are going to make a deep run? I look at Baylor, to me, as the clear number two team in the country. Uh, I look at Baylor making the championship. Uh, For the record, I've got uh, more Big 12 teams in the Final Four than Big Ten teams. More on that as well. I look at looking in the Sweet 16. The Big Ten might be the conference to watch early in the tournament. Once we get to the Elite Eight and specifically uh, the Final Four, keep an eye on the Big 12. Don't don't think they're beating Gonzaga, but there's going to be two Big 12 teams in the Final Four. 
and we're about to get into that. I'm going to save the second well, pick. Real quick, real quick. Uh, I, I did think of the conference. I will go with the sheer volume Big Ten. Yeah. So real quickly, Big Ten has one seed in Illinois and Michigan, two seeds in Iowa and Ohio State, uh, certainly four of probably the top eight teams in the country. I uh, look at the Big 12, they've got one seed Baylor, three seeds in KU and West Virginia, a four seed in Oklahoma State, which is one of the most egregious mistakes the tournament committee has ever made. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so, I mean, it'll be interesting. Uh, one other upset to look for, uh, Kansas in the second round is going to play against uh, USC. Uh, Mobley, who will probably be the second pick in the NBA draft, the big guy that can block shots, he can shoot. Uh, look for Kansas dealing with the COVID issues to fall in that game against USC in the second round upset, six seed USC uh, beating the Kansas Jayhawks. Um, that's one to look for. But uh, as far as conferences, yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely the Big Ten and the Big 12. It'll be one of those two. I think every other conference is so far behind those two. Although I think the Pac-12 may have been slept on a little bit as we saw um you know, with what Oregon State did and just some of the talent some of those teams have. But I, I think it's definitely Big Ten, uh, Big 12. Uh, ACC also looks a little better. Georgia Tech and UNC played well down the stretch, so look out for them. But, I mean, do you guys want to get into the final four picks? Because I feel great about my picks. I feel absolutely amazing about the final four this year. I mean... I, I feel pretty pretty good about it too, Common. You've been teasing that uh, you're you're actually kind of going a little bit larger bracket pool uh, strategy on yours, I think, because I, I have a pretty good idea of where you're going. Um, sure. Yeah, I think I think for uh, for me, final four this year, you know, uh, the the teams that I'm picking all kind kind of come down to some similar themes, and this kind of follows along with uh, what I do in general for my bracket. I like teams that have good depth. I like teams that don't have any super obvious weaknesses, and I like teams that are efficient, that are capable of scoring and defending really well. Um, you know, looking at efficiency, basically what that does is it normalizes numbers so that if you have a team that shoots a lot of shots and scores more points, uh, but maybe not quite as efficiently as some other team that takes fewer shots but actually gets okay. more value. Colgate. You know, 14 seed in the number two scoring team in the country. Exactly. And, and the interesting thing with Colgate, because I'll, I'll touch on that as, you know, one of the popular upset picks that I'm not quite so bought in on. Colgate's played all of four teams this season because the way that the Patriot League kind of like staggered their schedule due to COVID, they played Army, I think Bucknell and like one other school, and they just rotated playing the same teams over and over and over again. Back to back um, and so what that did was that kind of like that just like threw a wrench into all these different efficiency ratings for Colgate. So they look really good from a numbers perspective, and I have no uh, doubt that they're capable of shooting the ball. But playing the Arkansas Razorbacks is an entirely different animal uh, from from you know the the teams in the Patriot League. So they should be fun to watch. I think we're only going to see them once, though. Um, for me, moving into the Final Four. Um, there's lots and lots of chalk in my bracket. That's because I feel like there are pretty clear lines between the top eight teams in the country and everyone else. Uh, so for me, I have Gonzaga uh, coming out of their region. I have Baylor coming out of their region. Those have been two teams that we talked about, had a question a couple of weeks ago, you know, Baylor and Gonzaga against the field. And, you know, we all seem pretty confident with, uh, with those two teams, one of the two being uh, championship worthy. Uh, I'm a big fan of the way that Illinois has played down the stretch here and the development we have seen with the depth on their team. So uh, I have them coming out of their region and then can't go straight, you know, ones across the board. That's only happened once. And Michigan has had some issues. So I'm going with Alabama. Michigan's had, you know, one of their best players, Livers, is uh, he's currently out with a stress injury in his foot. They're being really tight-lipped about him coming back. If he does, that might change things up with Michigan, how far they advance. Uh, but Alabama has been playing exceptionally well uh, down the stretch here, winning the SEC title game uh, against some really close games, some really tough games that have really, uh, you know, steel uh, sharpens steel, iron sharpens iron uh, for the tournament. So I like the uh, the Razorbacks in the Final Four 
being that two seed. Now, if I were in a, if a couple larger brackets, I'm like, I'm sorry? You just said the Razorbacks an accident. You meant the same. I meant the Crimson Tide, yes. Um, you know, if I were in a larger bracket, I might change things up a little bit, but uh, the pools that I'm currently in are relatively small, so I'm going to go chalk and count on getting the earlier round uh, of picks correct as a little bit of a differentiator for me there. You have the exact same bracket strategy as my girlfriend now. That's her Really? Strategy. She looks at the seeds and she says they're a lower seed. I must pick or the, the higher seed. They've got a three next to them against the six. I got to go with the three. So that's her strategy. See, and that's where I'm going to look for value earlier on. I'm going to look to make my hay in the round of 32 and the sweet 16 and then keep it relatively uh, buttoned up close to the vest for favorites uh, going the rest of the way. Yeah. Drew, you, you, I mean, what do you think? You like sometimes picks? How, how are you feeling about Mr. Castleman? Yeah, you know, I, I, a lot of chalk there, which I understand. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this year just so wide open. I, I think we – I don't know if we see a double-digit seed, but you mentioned Michigan State, UCLA, Syracuse, all solid teams. I don't know if we'll see them make the Final Four, but, you know, one of those teams could make a run. And um, as far as the Final Four goes – yeah, you got to think chalk is the way to go uh, this year, but man, I I just I don't like going all one seeds. I mean, you said it; it's only happened one time, and it was a no eight. And mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if I had all one seeds. I can't remember back to that to that time, but I definitely had three of them. Yeah. What'd you have? I had three of them also. I think yeah. I didn't pick Kansas, right? Who won that year? North Carolina. Yeah, that may have was it North Carolina or was that the year that Kentucky with Anthony Davis? No, it was North Carolina. Davis was the next year. It was UNC gotcha. Pro One, which I picked because I was a diehard UNC fan, which is what led me to pick Davis and to make the Elite Eight because they barely lost to UNC like the first game of the season. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was UNC. I think it was at UCLA, Kansas, and who's the other one? Not Illinois. I have to look it up. No, no. No, Memphis was another year. I can't Illinois? remember. It was not Illinois. Illinois oh. was 05. I'll have more on that team in, in later in this show as well. Um, I remember that I didn't have Kansas because I'm not a Kansas fan. <laughs> and at the time, I wasn't even going to Mizzou, but I think Kansas was maybe the one I excluded. I can't remember for sure, though. That might have been like what? Kevin Love and, and Russell West, West Brick playing together for UCLA. Well, regardless, don't go all chalk in the final four. So I'm going chalk for two of the teams, three of the teams, really, uh, and then one not chalk. So the biggest chalk is Gonzaga, best team in the country. Uh, They've gone undefeated. Uh, They've had, you know, they played some good tournament teams. A lot of people don't realize that they say, oh, Gonzaga played in a bad conference. Well, they beat West Virginia and Kansas, who are three seeds in this tournament in the non-conference. Uh, They beat Virginia, a four seed. They beat Iowa, a two seed. Uh, They beat six seeded BYU three times. And all those wins were all by double digits, minus against West Virginia, a game that their star freshman Jalen Suggs got hurt, missed a good chunk of the game, came back, uh, helped give them a spark. They beat West Virginia in that one. So Gonzaga is the number one scoring team in the country, undefeated, rattled off a crazy streak of double-digit wins. Uh, they're definitely going to be the lock, I think. And, you know, they've beaten the top teams in their region. Their region is crazy because you look at Iowa, who's their biggest threat. Well, we already saw that matchup earlier this mm-hmm. season, and Gonzaga had their way with the Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, my second lock pick is Baylor. These are the two picks I feel really good about. I was talking to a friend earlier today. I don't think I've ever filled out a bracket in my life, except for maybe 05, where I felt more confidence in a national championship game. 05, Illinois, UNC, that was the consensus pick. It happened. And this year, Gonzaga, Baylor, it's the same thing. I know Illinois is getting a lot of love as well, but I think Baylor is the slam dunk second best team in the country. Uh, They've played in the tough Big 12. They lost two games all year. Well, guess what? They lost on the road at Kansas right after they came back from a COVID outbreak, so hard to get that rhythm going. Mm -hmm. Then they lost against Oklahoma State in the Big 12 championship game. 
Uh, Baylor is shooting 41.8% from three this season, the best three-point shooting team in the country, one of the best three-point shooting teams of the last 25 years. They were ice cold against Oklahoma State, just completely ice cold from three. It happens. You're going to have one game where you're going to go ice cold because they've got like eight guys who are shooting eight or nine, shooting above 40%. They had one game where they were ice cold and they lost. Guess what? They got it out of the way. They're going to be at their best in the tournament. Baylor, a lock to make the Final Four uh, against Gonzaga in that championship game. The third team that I'm going with is kind of the least popular one seed. A lot of people want to count out Michigan. This Isaiah Livers storyline is the most overrated thing I've ever heard. The way we're talking about this guy is as if he's a lottery pick. Guess what he led the team in this year? What category? How many categories did he lead Michigan in this season? Steals? Zero. Zero. Oh, okay. He didn't lead them in scoring. He was third in rebounding, not even close in steals, assists, or blocks. This guy is, by the way, Hunter Dickinson is the second team All-American. I heard the ESPN guys say Isaiah Livers is their best player. Guess what, guys? Hunter Dickinson is a freshman compared to the senior Livers, and Dickinson is the second team All-American, uh, led the team in scoring. Perhaps their most versatile player is Franz uh, Wagner there. He's so versatile on offense and defense. He can play one through four. Uh, you look at Mike Smith, their point guard. He put on a show in the Big Ten tournament against Maryland, 15 assists. I mean, he is a smart basketball player. He's so smart, in fact, that he comes from the Ivy League. He played at Columbia last season where he averaged 22 points per game. Now he comes to Michigan. He's more unselfish, only nine a game, dishing out the assists. If Livers doesn't play, I still look for uh, Smith to step up his scoring. Uh, I look for... Dickinson, who's a second-team All-American as a freshman, to step up his scoring. This Isaiah Livers storyline, this is all it is for the talking heads at ESPN to have a story, to have a reason not to pick Michigan. Oh, they lost the Big Ten championship game or the semifinal without Livers. You know what? They lost the game. It happens. You lose the game. Do I think they're better with him? Sure. But they're still good enough to win in their region. They're definitely better than Alabama. I mean, as much as I love Alabama, uh, that was a horrible SEC conference this season. Uh, I, I think Alabama, compared to, say, Iowa or Ohio State, is a much weaker two seed. Uh, I look for Michigan to make the Final Four to prove the haters wrong. Because you think, look at how Illinois came out of late. Uh, for most of the year, Michigan was clearly the number three team in the country. So I looked for the three best teams in the country uh, to make it. Illinois might be a little bit better than Michigan right now because of the Livers thing. But guess what, guys? Illinois, as good as they look right now, they're a little bit inconsistent. They lost to our alma mater, Mizzou. How can I trust them if they lost to Mizzou? They had some random losses. They lost to Rutgers also. I think that team is susceptible, but the main reason why I'm not picking Illinois to make the Final Four is as soon as I started watching the Big 12 tournament this weekend, I became absolutely captivated with Kate Cunningham and the Oklahoma State Cowboys. So I, was, I told myself, if they're not in Baylor or Gonzaga's side, I'm picking Oklahoma State to the Final Four because we talked about it. It's never all one seeds minus ones. I'm picking Oklahoma State as a four seed. They should have been a two or three seed, as I talked about. And that's going to be one of probably one of the best games of the tournament, that Sweet 16 game. Ayo Dosunmo with Illinois, the star guard. And then you have Cade Cunningham, the star guard uh, from Oklahoma State, probably two of the top three players in the country, along with, obviously, Garza at Iowa, but certainly the two best guards in that game. Um, I like Oklahoma State, though, because they're hot. I know we talk about Illinois being hot, but Oklahoma State has been just as hot, winning eight of the last ten against almost all top 25 teams. And people people get caught up in Cade Cunningham being the number one draft pick. I'm enamored with him. But this is not a one-man show. This Oklahoma State team happened to beat West Virginia without Cade Cunningham. And they have... Tom, you talk about teams with no weaknesses. 
Well, they have a lot of good guard play. Avery Anderson, Isaac Likely, uh, both are very efficient guys, shoot high percentages from two-point and three-point land, as does Cunningham. And then I don't know if you watched uh, the Big 12 tournament, but Caleb Boone down there, the big man, he is a block machine. He blocks everything that comes his way. He can rebound, he can block, he can score. We got three great guards, we got a great big guy, we've got a hot team. And what do I look for in March? I look for superstars. And Kate Cunningham is the biggest star in this tournament. I think he delivers, scores 30 plus points against Illinois. They squeak by winning the Sweet 16. Oklahoma State, by the way, has played phenomenal in close games this season. Cunningham plays phenomenal in second half, much like Stephen Curry in 2008 against Gonzaga in the opening round, scoring 30 points in the second half. Expect for Cunningham to get 30 in the second half, maybe one of these games. Big 12 title game, by the way, Oklahoma State, why did they lose to Texas? Texas had a day off because of Kansas's COVID issues, and uh, Cunningham got in foul trouble the first half. They, had a, they were down big. They came back. I actually thought they were better than Texas watching that game. I'm all about the Cowboys of Oklahoma State. Give them to me for the Final Four. Sure. I'm not sure if you're keeping track. How many Davidson and Steph Curry references are we up to now? I think we already have a show record. We're not even an hour in. Absolutely. I think that's going to be basically the whole show. I, I think the over-under was set for 20 and a half, and we're halfway there. Did one of us lock that in? I forgot if we did that on the previous show. <laughs> I love Steph Curry and Davidson. What can I say? We, we know. <laughs> we do know. We do know. Yeah. So it's probably only my number two favorite tournament memory. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but uh, final four, so Tom and I uh, were flipping. We both got Baylor and Gonzaga, but uh, he's got uh, Oklahoma – uh, I've got Oklahoma State. Uh, he has um, Illinois. Illinois, and then I've got Michigan. He has Alabama. Uh, Drew is not sure what he's going with, but he's advising uh, he's advising to go chalk, but not all chalk. So I think he's thinking three one seeds. Um, but as far as the championship game itself, what what do we see uh, potentially there? I mean, is it the slam dunk Baylor and Gonzaga pick that? You know, we've been talking about all year on this show. It kind of reminds me of how all year we were talking college football, Alabama, Clemson. How uh, Clemson didn't get there, but Alabama did. And we've been talking Baylor, Gonzaga, all year college basketball. Well, I think we're going to have a, a similar uh, story for the championship game, at least from me. Uh, I've got Gonzaga as my Alabama equivalent, the team that has just been you know, clearly one of the best in the country and, you know, seemingly without weakness. Uh, but kind of similar to the college football playoff, I'm also going with an up-and-coming Big Ten team. I'm going with Illinois to beat Baylor in what is going to be a phenomenal game. I think that, I mean, we're going to see several phenomenal games out of Illinois, whether they're facing Georgia Tech or Loyola. And then you've got Oklahoma State, uh, you know, or maybe Tennessee, but probably Oklahoma State. And then even coming out of the bottom of that bracket, there's a couple of really good teams that Illinois could be facing. Nothing will be given to them. Nothing will be easy. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the way that they're playing right now, Io DeSumo is fantastic. Uh, Andre Carbello has been amazing with, with his game and showing that he's not too afraid of the moment as a freshman guard. Uh, he made some really, really big shots in overtime and down the stretch against Ohio State in the Big Ten Championship game. And, you know, also, you know, Kofi Coburn, he is a bit of a rarity in being, you know, a truly just dominant post player uh, in March Madness. We don't see a ton of those simply because it's so much easier to be a guard than it is, you know, a skilled and talented big man. Um, and he's certainly the frontliner for that, but Illinois also has some depth, so you know, I'm really impressed with what uh, Underwood has done, bringing uh, Illinois back to some relevance, you know, as they reached that peak uh, back in 2005, I believe it was, against UNC. They've, they've dipped down quite a bit, but they're back, and it'll be interesting to see if they're here to stay. But I think that they are going to be able to fight through, and in a very, very good, entertaining game against Baylor, I think they will edge out the Big 12 regular season champs to make it to the, the title game. And then... Uh, and are we, are we going to pick winners out of this, or is that what we're going to address next? No, I'm going to give my final game, then we'll pick okay. winners. 
little tease that drum roll. Um, yeah, I mean, by the way, Tom, for the record, I'm not highly confident in Oklahoma State, but I mm -hmm. said we got to go confident with for our sure. pick. Obviously, I think that Illinois-Oklahoma State game uh, has the potential outside of maybe a Final Four championship game being the game of the tournament, and it still might be because of those two great guards going at each other. Uh, two lottery picks. Cunningham will be the first pick, but the Sumu will also be a lottery pick, and his coach, Brad Underwood, has gone as far as calling him the best player in the country, and it's sometimes hard to argue with him because he, he is that good. I, I really think that you've got probably two of the top three players in the country mm -hmm. uh, in that game. Uh, I, I just I have a feeling on Illinois. I just have a feeling that we're going to see, see them not deliver. If they're playing at their best, I think they might be a little bit better than Oklahoma State, but I don't, I'm not convinced just because I think Kate Cunningham is that good. I look at, I honestly think, Tom, right now Oklahoma State is a top four team in the country. If we did this right now and we had to name the top four teams in the country, I would probably say it's Gonzaga, Baylor, uh, Illinois, Oklahoma State, and Michigan. Those five would be uh, in the mix for me. Um, so, I mean, it could that game could go either way. I think mm -hmm. Illinois – could potentially make the championship, but I still think they're a clear number three, four, five team in the country because I do think Baylor is better. I think Baylor's more consistent. Uh, I think, um, you know, Baylor is uh, the team that's third in the nation at 84 points per game, but these guys can shoot the ball. I said it, nearly 42% from the field uh, as, a, as a team from three. They have nine guys who shoot 38.6 or higher from three, including five who are higher than 40% now. Of those nine guys, about three of them are bench players, but they basically have like five or six regulars who are shooting uh, in the 40% or right below it, and that includes first-team All-American Jared Butler, third-team All-American uh, Davion Mitchell. Uh, they also have Teague, another great guard who shoots threes, uh, and they have another guy, uh, number 24, I'm blanking on his name off the top of my head. He shoots crazy threes as well. So um, they have so many three-point shooters that they had one game that they were cold in the Big 12 championship game, but someone's going to be hot. And I trust in their depth more than Illinois' depth. You talk about Carbello, also Frazier. Uh, these are guards that are inconsistent for Illinois. And as good as Col Colfern is, the big guy, the seventh footer, he's actually been pretty inconsistent. Uh, the soon moves, the one guy who I trust on Illinois. Uh, I trust three guys on Baylor. And ultimately, I trust Cade Cunningham more than the soon move. And that's why I took the Cade Cunningham star power, uh, both of those guys being all Americans. Uh, but championship game, uh, you've got Gonzaga and Illinois. I've got Gonzaga and Baylor. What are we thinking here? I mean, I'm going to stick with the team that I've been saying, I think, from the beginning of the season, Gonzaga. And, and not just me. I mean, a lot of people have been on this team and is, is calling it Mark Few's greatest team, most talented team. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, a, a lot of good Gonzaga teams in recent years, but uh, we're seeing perhaps the first one that has truly elite NBA talent on. I know Adam Morrison, uh, I believe, was a top three draft pick in the NBA and didn't shake out too well there, but... You know, we've talked about all these great players in the tournament. We really haven't touched on the great roster that Gonzaga has. You have Jalen Suggs, uh, their point guard, who is going to be a top five lottery pick, depending on how uh, how that shakes out and what different teams' draft priorities are. Um, you probably, yeah, like like three. I mean, maybe two if if somebody wants him over uh, Mobley. Um, you've got Kispert, who is a fantastic three point shooter. Uh, you've got uh, Drew Tim, who is, you know, the big man in the middle type of thing. You even have depth with guys like Joel Ayayi and um, Nembard. Uh, you've got great depth on the front line as well as in the backcourt. Uh, so for me, I'm going with Gonzaga, uh, you know, changing up again who their opponent is in the title game. But, of course, would not be at all surprised if, if Baylor was the team uh, opposite them. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Gonzaga. I think this is like the third or fourth time I've picked them to win the title Here's hoping that this time they actually come through. The closest they got was facing uh, UNC uh, a few years back and then coming up a little bit short, but uh, they certainly have the top-end talent and uh, diversity on their team to be able to beat you a lot of different ways. Yeah, Gonzaga is kind of that team that is like 
a true mid-major, but they're a powerhouse. And the one thing they're missing is the national title. Uh, they were missing the Final Four. They got it. They were missing the championship appearance. They got it a few years ago against UNC. This is kind of the prize jewel that they're missing. And they've gotten so good over the years that they used to have uh, really good teams without, per se, great prospects. But now they're all of a sudden starting to get the prospects. Jalen Suggs, five-star prospect. He was a big deal. Um, three All-Americans. No other team in the country had three All-Americans. You talked about a senior, Corey Kispert, first-team All-American. Uh, he can shoot the ball. He can do everything. Uh, you talked about Drew Timmy. Uh, he's a sophomore, second-team All-American. Jalen Suggs, second-team All-American. All three of these guys are projected in the NBA draft. All three of them might be first-round picks, Suggs, of course, being the lottery pick, but the other two guys might go later uh, in the first round. And we really hadn't seen that as much from Gonzaga. I know they had uh, Sabonis a couple years ago. He turned into an NBA All-Star this year. Um, Morrison was a big bust. But for all the talent that they've had, they've never had three NBA-ready guys, which they have right now. They have three NBA guys, and no other team in the country can really say that. Even Baylor, you look at like a guy like Davion Mitchell, you look at the mock drafts, he's projected late in the first round. Uh, so you look at Suggs, Suggs projected to be the second or third pick, and he might not be the best player on his team. He's not the first-team All-American. He kind of makes it all go, but I think this is – uh, this is the team to beat. Uh, I think uh, they're going to be the first team since 1976 in Indiana to go undefeated and win the national championship. Uh, Bobby Knight is not going to be too happy about that. Um, also, a shout-out to Tom Castleman. Uh, we've got a show bracket pool, and, you know, um, to Tom Castleman, I think, in that, is in my bracket, and he's called, called his team name Ziga when they Zaga. That was a very clever team name. I literally laughed out loud at it, but they are going to zigga when other people zaga because this is the team to beat uh, in March Madness. Anything else to add? I mean, Drew, do you have any insights on, on all this? No, I mean, you know, just uh, I must say be careful about, you know, who you choose late because those are the games that matter when it comes to brackets, of course. Drew. And as a bracket, you would know better than perhaps anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Castleman. We needed at least one bracket pun in this. Like, <laughs> Well done. Bracketology and Tom one-upped me and came up with something even more original. Of course he, yeah, of course he did. Castleman, Drew. was he had that waiting. Yeah, Drew Brackett is his name, the last name, Mr. Brackett, for those that don't know. <laughs> like, you do say my name a lot in the show. I think people do know. Oh, just just want to make sure they, they, they know the joke. Um, well, I know I was, I was thinking about my, my uh, you know, memories of the NCAA tournament, and we've been spoiled recently with some amazing games. I mean, we had that North Carolina Villanova game, the Chris Jenkins shot. Uh, people sometimes forget Marcus Page on mm -hmm. North Carolina hit a massive three with like four or five seconds left, and it was really off balance. I don't know how it went in, but people forget how amazing that shot was. And then Chris Jenkins just topped it somehow. Uh, but that that's uh, one of my recent memories. I remember one of my first memories was the Mario Chalmers three-pointer uh, against uh, Memphis. Yeah, against Memphis, because mm -hmm. Derrick Rose was struggling from the free throw line, and that opened the door for the Jayhawks. That's one of my uh, early memories. I know that was probably in high school, but that, that's one of my memories of uh, the NCAA tournament. Was it not high school? No, it was high school. Oh, okay, okay. Junior year, one of those. Yeah, it was high school. Um, yeah, we're getting into our favorite memories. Uh, a, few, a few things that stick out to me. Uh, first, I first remember watching Illinois in like 2000, 2001. They had like Brian Cook. That was a fun team to watch. Um, I vividly remember Dwayne Wade in 2003, specifically the Elite Eight, Elite Eight game against Kentucky. I had to look up the stats. 29 points, 11 rebounds, and 11 assists. A triple-double in the Elite Eight. 
against the mighty Kentucky Wildcats, which would spur on Dwayne Wade, of course, the most underrated player in NBA basketball history, does not get the respect he deserves. I've always felt that he was right up there with Kobe in terms of uh, abilities and talent. I think uh, later part of his career, many injuries, he sacrificed a lot playing with uh, LeBron James. But Dwayne Wade was a true star, and he was a star in the tournament. Uh, probably my favorite tournament memory would probably surprise you guys. I know I talk about Stephen Curry a lot. Um, it's the 05 Illinois basketball team. I, I am now a Mizzou fan, um, and I, it's a rivalry with Illinois, and I've got friends and family who go to Illinois. So I don't really cheer on Illinois anymore. I don't. But I used to in 2005, and they had uh, what I consider the most fun team in college history. Maybe not the best, certainly, but the most fun. They had uh, D. Brown, Luther Head, and Darren Williams, uh, the three guards, and they were all about the three ball uh, they went undefeated in the regular season, lose by one point in the Big Ten Championship. Uh, I still thought that I was the reason they lost because I went to umpire training. It was the only game I missed all year. I blamed myself for the loss. And I had a feeling that that team was invincible. In my head, I thought that that team could not lose. And then in the Elite Eight game, I was watching at my friend's house at the time, and his brother says, they're done. They're down Late in the game, I, I re-watched the tape today a couple hours ago, watched the full last uh, five minutes in overtime, and I remember telling him, no, they're going to come back. He said, no way. Well, I was right. They came back. He was wrong. Uh, and here's the breakdown. If you haven't watched this game, go back and watch the highlights on YouTube. Uh, you can find the last five minutes in overtime of the Elite Eight game in 2005. Number one seed, Illinois. Number three seed, Arizona. 77-63, 14-point lead with 3.28 left in the game. 14-point lead, three and a half minutes to go. Then it was 125 to go. It was a nine-point lead. Uh, 103 to go, eight-point lead. Illinois hits a three, steals the ball, hits another three. Darren Williams at the end. And then in overtime, they hang on the win by one point. I don't know what Arizona was doing at the end of the shot clock in that game, but the 05 um, Elite Eight game, Arizona and Illinois, one of the all-time great comebacks in the tournament. Uh, and that was actually the year I had the best bracket. I had all Final Four teams making it that year, Michigan State. Uh, everyone was hating on the Big Ten. They said Illinois' schedule was bad. I was like, don't hate on the Big Ten. I'm putting putting in uh, – Michigan State, I think Louisville made the Final Four that year. That's before they were in a Power Five conference. I think they were still in Conference USA for basketball, maybe, if I remember correctly. Uh, that was the same tournament where Kevin Pitsnago and West Virginia uh, made the Elite Eight as a seven seed. Pitsnago was a fun player to watch. So just everything about the 05 tournament. It's the first tournament that I remember just being so into it that, like, I was just, transfixed, and it was because of Illinois. They lost to UNC in the championship game. Uh, Sean May ended up being a bust in the NBA. Uh, that was a good memory. And then, of course, uh, 08 and Stephen Curry. Davidson, a 10 seed, beat 7 seed Gonzaga. Uh, Curry scores 30 in the second half, 40 for the game. Uh, they trailed by 15 early in the second half against 2 seed Georgetown. Didn't matter. They come back behind 33 points for Curry. Then they beat Wisconsin, the three seed, um, and then they fall by two against Kansas, the two seed. Curry, 40, 33, 30, and 25 points in that run. The legend of Curry was born. I was specifically happy because I had them in the Elite Eight, and at the time I was not as humble as I am now, so I definitely bragged about it a lot. But clearly I have become much more humble years later. Very man, much so. Man, you must have been like Davidson this, Davidson that, like once a minute back then. If 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 this is more humble than then, I think I think honestly, I put this in my notes. I think we've had like four or five shows now where you have mentioned Stephen Curry and the O eight Davidson. It was it Bobcats or Wildcats? It was one of the two. But you're on like a serious <laughs> streak if you go back and listen to the shows of you mentioning that specific you know, player and and team. Yeah, I take pride in my pick. 
10 seed to the lead eight, baby. I take a lot of pride in that pick. And you were, you were, you were less humble about it back then. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you, you covered it really well with the 05 uh, uh, Illinois team. That was the first year I actually ever filled out a bracket. I believe I was in eighth grade at the time. And I had them facing UNC. Didn't really know much about college basketball. I didn't really uh, follow that growing up. I followed more of the professional sports. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things where it's like the math teacher was like, hey, we're running, you know, a bracket. If you do, you know, so well on the bracket, you get a candy bar. And, I mean, for me as a kid, I mean, that's all you need to get me involved in just about anything, uh, except for vans, of course. Uh, say no to candy from strangers. Um, but that was definitely a great team to watch. It's what got me into it. And, um, you know, ever since, you know, there were a couple of, of great, uh, you know, Florida teams that came the year after leading to Joakim Noah and the Bulls. So there's a lot of connections that I made. And that was a really great, um, you know, just I'm, I'm just thankful for, for having witnessed that and been a part of it because it's just such an enjoyable experience for me. March Madness is, you know, the Christmas time of the sports calendar. It is better than the Super Bowl, the World Series, the NBA Finals. Uh, the product isn't always pretty to watch because these are amateur players. You'll see a lot of possessions where, uh, you know, it's just bad two-point shots. There's not always a lot of flow to the offense. But when it comes down to the last few seconds, the last few minutes of a game, few things are more gripping than that. Um, and kind of speaking on this, you know, one of the the greater memories that sticks out for me actually is one, probably the greatest miss of all time in NCAA history. If you remember uh, the Butler Bulldogs against the, uh, yeah. the Duke Blue Devils, you know, Gordon Hayward with that half court, you know, had a good clean look at the basket and almost hit the shot. And I could, you know, just, I, you know, I didn't pick them to go very far in the bracket or anything like that. But if there's one thing that sports fans can unite outside of uh, Durham, North Carolina, it's that nobody wants to see Duke succeed and we almost saw like the greatest, uh, you, you know, a small mid-major team beating arguably the the most well-known, most you know, powerful uh, basketball program of all time. So uh, you know that certainly stands out just as it being a miss, and yet it's still a really memorable moment. Real quick, real quick, I am about to do something that's going to surprise Drew Brackett. Are you ready for this, Drew? I, I, I don't even want to guess. I was going to say something, but I won't guess. <laughs> so, as you guys know, I have bragged on my Davidson pick. Uh, maybe, uh, the Elite Last Eight. 15 years, yeah. Yes. I will now tell you one of the all-time fail picks. In my oh, career. my. This is a first. I didn't know you failed. <laughs> <laughs> Massive. Massive failure. First so time hearing about it. Yeah. That tournament, I believe, Tom, was uh, 09 or 2010. I think it was 2010. I could look it up. I think it was 2009, actually, maybe. It was it was 09 season, 2010 tournament. It was freshman year of college. So we're filling out the brackets. And you know me. I love field goal percentage. My favorite stat. And I don't even remember who they were playing. But... Butler, I believe, was a five seed. Could cor- look it up. Correct me if I'm wrong. Talk on snap on my head here. Mm-hmm, and that sounds they, right. They didn't have a very good field goal percentage, and that's before I realized that Brad Stevens just worked his magic, and they found ways to win every game somehow, some way. And the team they played, I think it was UTEP, maybe. The UTEP Miners of Texas El Paso had, like, a really good field goal percentage. So I went for the 12-5 upset. I think at the time Butler was in the Horizon League, so it was weird that it was mm-hmm. like two mid-majors playing each other in the 5-12 game. And I had Butler out the first round, and then they made it all the way to the national championship. So, <laughs> wow. There, there you have it, Drew. I have wow. about a massive fail of mine when it comes to bracket picking. I mean, I'm pretty sure not a lot of folks had Butler in the national championship mm-hmm. no. at that time. I, I imagine... Most didn't even have them in the Sweet 16. I don't remember the four seed. Could have been Arizona in that region. Hey. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, I thought he had enough. I don't have the full bracket. Not. not. Like Castleman. What year no. is this? Uh, well, I, think it was for, I was on Davidson. Davidson and, and Steph Curry. That run was in 2008. Yeah, I'm talking about 2010 when Butler made the Final Four as a five seed. We were trying to figure out who the four seed in that region was. 
I, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'll get All right. it. I'm, 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 I'm taking a, a long look as well. I don't even know what region they were in as far as direction, so I'm doing a lot of scrolling here. All right, the, so uh, the Butler open. was the uh, five seed Told in you. the West region, yep. and they did play UTEP, and they blew out UTEP. Yep. Uh, and then they um, – Murray State the was 13 next. seed, yeah, uh, beat Vanderbilt, Murray State, and then Butler beat Murray State by a couple. So, um. I guess if you picked Murray State over Vanderbilt, then you had Butler maybe, but uh, Syracuse was the one seed, and so I'm sure not many folks had uh, Butler over Syracuse. No, no, and that was I think that was like a Vanderbilt team. I mean, we were back in college where they choked like three straight years. They were like a four or five seed, and I think it was like they lost like three straight years in the first round, and they had like four seniors on the team, and they're like, this is the first time they'll finally get that over the hump win and they didn't get it. So, um, and then I think, yeah, Kansas state was the two seed. And I think that was the Ch- Jacob Poland year yeah. or years. No, knowing myself, that was probably my final four pick that year out of that. Region. Yeah, Frank, Frank Martin was the coach. Mm-hmm. That was a fun team. And that's back when Mizzou was in uh, the big 12. I, I, and I think Kansas state made the elite eight. Maybe I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, Here's one yeah, for you. Do you know who, baller. Do you know who was an assistant on that Kansas State team? Brad oh. Underwood. Oh, there you go. Really? Wow. Yeah, we were talking. I think this was pre-show. Tom was name dropped Brad Underwood, I believe. But there you go. Yeah, I think he was talking about uh, Oklahoma State. He used to coach at Oklahoma State. Mm-hmm. He could go up against Oklahoma State in the Sweet 16. Um, so that'll be interesting. Yeah, so that was that was one of my all-time bracket fails. I think 05, I had almost the perfect bracket, but back in the day it was a paper bracket, so I have no proof of it. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you don't you don't have it framed somewhere? I don't have it framed anywhere. I did frame my Roger Federer poster I just bought, so I a can nice have one. a background. So it's just such a great look at that. It's just beautiful. Think of beauty, Roger Federer. And then there's Lionel Messi, the greatest player of all time. Of any sport. Well, well, back in the day, I I know you guys may remember, but we actually had to cut the bracket out of the newspaper. Yeah. So I remember on the first day on Monday when the bracket was in the paper, you cut out that one. Then on Tuesday, you had to cut out another one because my dad wanted to fill one out. Then my mom (laughs) wanted to do it. So every single day, you had to cut out a new bracket. And that's, that's what my girlfriend's grandma's waiting on, by the way. Because she's old. The newspaper. Yeah, and she, and she asked her if, if you if you filled out uh, your bracket or you're going to, and she's like, I gotta wait for the newspaper. So some people still do it that way. So that's a generation. Oh. Thing. I think she's 91, 92 years old. So that'll that'll tell you why. Well, but, hopefully the Tribune uh, gets to her place somewhat soon. I hope so. We we can certainly hope so because I'd like to see how her bracket compares to mine. That would be an interesting uh, competition in itself. Um, but I'll tell you this, uh, guys, talking about memories, you know, what NBA players do you remember playing in college basketball when they first became stars? I know we talked plenty about Stephen Curry, over 20 and a half references. I'm over it now just because it's like Allen Iverson in practice. We're talking about practice. We're talking about Curry, Mr. Enchev, but what other guys besides Stephen Curry do you first remember watching in college hoops and uh, the college tournament specifically? Yeah, well, I mean, I mentioned, uh, you know, Gordon Hayward, his iconic shot. Um, I also remember really like watching Anthony Davis just because he was he was just unfair uh, and during his only year at Kentucky in terms of, you know, he was a point guard in high school, had a big growth spurt to the point of being six foot eleven. Uh, so just like his combination of, of size and skill was incredible. But I think perhaps the one of the best Marsh runs that Kemba we'll Walker. ever see is Kemba Walker in 2011. Um, just like I, I pulled up all the stats from from that game or from his games from, you know, the Big East tournament, even before March Madness, all the way through the end. I'm not going to run through them all because there's so many games, but suffice it to say, he was incredible. He was everything that UConn needed him to be. 
and I believe they were a seven seed that year. Um, I remember because I picked Kawhi Leonard and his San Diego State Aztecs to win. They had a little bit of a brush up going into a TV timeout. Uh, you know, technical foul was called on San Diego State. I was livid. It was such a close game. I I was convinced that that was what let UConn go on and win. I had San Diego State as my dark horse to win the title uh, behind Kawhi Leonard, but Kemba Walker just incredible. And and there's just something about when guards do well, just like how magical it is. Because usually they're the ones that are taking and making those last second shots right at the buzzer. Uh, so Kemba Walker 2011 is is certainly a memorable run. Probably uh, the greatest you know March tournament run that uh, that's ever been yeah absolutely real quick we're talking about memories one of the first things I remember too is is uh, my fifth grade teacher I talked about it last week but it would be a failure not to mention it again uh, he had us fill out um, where we each had a tournament team we got to watch the games in class Weber's team ended up winning the tournament got a basketball I at the time it was Indiana and Maryland I think Maryland won the championship um, I believe this was like oh three maybe I can't remember exactly. That sounds right. But it was Maryland with Juan Dixon uh, winning the championship. Uh, but we had to fill out the state colors of the state birds, like all this info. We had to learn about the state our team was from. And yes, there's no state colors. I know I messed that up again, Drew. But <laughs> some, something of that sort. And I remember I had Creighton and they were playing Florida, I think. And it was like Mike Miller was on Florida. And it was like a 12 5 upset in overtime. And we're watching the game in class, and I'm like, that's my team, that's my team. And they won, and it was really cool. As far as superstars, I think the Kemba Walker run uh, was amazing. I mean, up there with the Stephen Curry run, uh, the most uh, amazing things we've seen with guard plays. I mentioned Dwayne Wade in 03, leading Marquette to the Final Four, uh, triple double against Kentucky in the Elite Eight game. I have to mention Carmelo Anthony as a freshman. Mm-hmm. Uh, there you go. Syracuse over Kansas. Uh, Kirk Heinrich, Captain Kirk, was on that KU team. Uh, phenomenal uh, run for Carmelo Anthony. You talked about Anthony Davis. Another one I had written down. Yeah, he was a cheat code in college. And as good as he is now at blocking shots, I don't think people remember that he used to get like four to five blocks a game. Like when he actually mm-hmm. played, because he got taken out early in the game often, Like, if he actually played the whole game, he would get, like, five blocks in a game. I mean, he was just unfair as a freshman, Kentucky, uh, winning that national championship. I think that was 2013, I believe. Um, No. Yeah, maybe it was 2013. One of those years we were in college. I can't remember now. But uh, that certainly – They kind of blend – yeah, they all blend together. A real quick honorable mention, uh, he didn't do anything uh, in the tournament. In fact, uh, he got upset in the first round, but I really enjoyed Katie. Yeah, watching Kevin Durant play in college yeah. for Texas. He was phenomenal. He at one point was like leading the country in points and rebounds. As good as a rebounder as he is now, people forget that he was getting 12 to 13 rebounds a game in college. So he doesn't get as many rebounds as he used to now. Uh, He used to pull up for three. That was back in the day where it was just completely unheard of, of a near seven-footer hitting threes like that. Uh, Kevin Durant was a joy to watch uh, in college. He actually played with DJ Augustine, who briefly played in the NBA. I think he was most recently on the Magic. I I don't remember where he is now. But um, that was an interesting team to watch. Um, But, yeah, so many good memories, and this is when these NBA Guys, you know, that's when they're born. I mean, Christian Leitner in 92, that was before our time, but that's an iconic shot that we've seen played over and over and over, hit that shot uh, over Kentucky in the Elite Eight. So, so many great memories and so many guys making their names heard in the tournament. Yeah, you bring up Carmelo. Uh, I was a little young. Well, well, I can't remember it totally right now, but uh, it's pretty vague, but... Uh, something I do remember, not trying to troll Common here, but uh, UCLA in 06, Westbrook was a freshman. He wasn't really a core uh, part of the team. I mean, it was the Aaron Aflalo, Darren Collison. Those guys were really good. I think they made the Elite Eight or uh, Final Four, I think. But I remember watching those games. I was at like a Chili's 
in Denver watching those games, and uh, that yeah. that's my kind of you what. I love Chili's. As Michael Scott would say from The Office, <laughs> all good business is done in a Chili's. So. Of course. So maybe that's why I was there watching uh, the UCLA Elite Eight game against whoever it was. But, uh, yeah, anyway, that, that was a fun game to watch at the Chili's. Kevin Love in college because he used to throw those passes he still does in the NBA, like the outlets where he would outlet it the full length of the court. Uh, he was a he was an animal to watch in college for UCLA. Was that later? That was later, right? Um, yeah, he he was. I think he did play with Westbrook one year, and I think Westbrook was older than him, though, if I believe correctly. So that may not have been like I don't know that he played with. Well, he might have played with Collison. I don't think he played with Aflalo. I think Aflalo played when UCLA beat Adam Morrison. Uh, that was crazy, if I remember correctly. And UCLA had one of the greatest comebacks. Like Gonzaga was like winning the whole game, and UCLA came back and beat Gonzaga. Real quickly, oh, yeah. I also miss Gus Johnson doing play-by-play. One of the worst things that CBS has ever done, uh, getting rid of Gus Johnson. I don't know what the issue was there. Uh, he's honestly better than Jim Nance. He now he does the games for Fox Sports. So I heard him in the Big East tournament. That was exciting to hear, but like, he was so good. Like Gus Johnson, famous play-by-play calls in the tournament are just wonderful. He gets so excited, and he has one of the lines where he's like, and the slipper still fits. Oh, just, just good stuff, good stuff. And, of course, I'd be uh, reminisced to mention that one shining moment at the end of the tournament, I'm a sucker for the song of one shining moment where they show all the cool moments, the heartbreak and the joy. Oh, man, I look forward to that every year. That is exciting stuff. And Tom talked about listing off the best sporting events. I mean, you can make a case for this being my third favorite sporting event, if not second. I mean, I think World Cup has to be number one for soccer. The whole world is watching. I think the Olympic Games are up there. March Madness is up there. I mean, I have really enjoyed the NBA Finals in recent memory, but there is something to be said about that whole March Madness feel, and that's why you have the same thing with the World Cup and the Olympics. You're presenting your school. You're presenting your country. It has a little extra uh, special feel to it. Drew, any other memories? Who did you support? Were you a Colorado Buffs fan back in the day? Back in the day, yeah, I, I just can't, I can't remember uh, players or they anything were, like that. Chauncey Billups was way before your time, right? You were like a mm-hmm. like very, very young for Chauncey. Billups. Oh yeah, well before my time. Yeah, because he's a famous Colorado guard uh, there. Um, so well, the Buffs, you know, the five seed this uh, year. See what they can do. Yeah, who do they play in the second round? Who's the four in that bracket? I remember that being a very tough pick. Honey, you just, Florida you just, States. Yeah, yeah, but it's funny you just assume that everybody's all the top seeds are going to win. Well, not all of them, but the but that one, Florida State, I remember I felt really good about it. I think I had Florida State in the Sweet 16. Leonard Hamilton, they showed a great piece. I don't know if you guys watched the three-hour uh, NCAA tournament coverage last night on ESPN. Uh, they did a great piece on Leonard Hamilton. Uh, he was the first uh, black assistant coach at Kentucky, and that was like a big breakthrough. Kentucky had never had a uh, black assistant. They didn't give him the job when the white coach didn't get hired, and before that he'd been like a assistant on Austin P. and uh, when the coach on Austin P. left, he really wanted him to become head coach, but again, he was African-American. They weren't ready to hire an African-American coach, uh, he went on to coach at Oklahoma State, finally getting his chance. And that used to be back in that time. I mean, we're talking like the 90s or something. And you didn't see very many African-American coaches. And then I believe he was the first one at Florida State. And it was just a whole piece on, uh, at one point, you know, this may be a stretch, but I mean, at one point they called Leonard Hamilton uh, the Jackie Robinson of college basketball. He was kind of the first. I mean, I know we have John Thompson, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's a big name for Georgetown when you think about, but still, he was kind of setting barriers himself. Uh, so that was a really cool piece they did on Leonard Hamilton last night. 
Absolutely, yeah. And he's he's one of my favorite coaches to 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 you know watch coach. <laughs> one of your favorite teams and coaches. You're like Florida State, the Portland Trailblazers, and the Indianapolis Colts are your random like I've, teams to follow. I am so dissatisfied with so many professional teams uh, here in Chicago that I feel the need to reach out elsewhere, and it is no exception. Uh, with the Bears, as we are getting uh, you know, free agency news, we're in the legal tampering period in the NFL where uh, agents and teams can negotiate and they can announce deals, uh, but they can't officially sign them until the league year starts in a couple of days. So uh, a, a big thing is that, that teams have to play around with is the salary cap, of course, and no position takes up more salary cap space for more teams than the quarterback position. So obviously being able to gain some flexibility there to help, you know, give uh, extra money for teams to be able to sign players. And, uh, you know, this year is no exception. We saw it with New Orleans and Drew Brees where he renegotiated his contract uh, down to a million dollars so that when he retired, it wasn't a massive cap hit uh, for the New Orleans Saints. And uh, we saw with the two teams that were in the Super Bowl this past year, with Tom Brady with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the uh, defending or the reigning uh, NFL champions, and then Kansas City Chiefs and, and Patrick Mahomes, who signed a 10-year contract extension that is, I think it's worth like $450 million with incentives. It can get up to half a billion dollars. Um, but both quarterbacks kind of changing their deals up a little bit, shifting around uh, some of that cap money so that uh, they can really – uh, let their teams work to keep the pieces in place to continue on making some championship runs. Yeah, we'll get to Drew Brees in a second, but since you're talking contracts, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think Mahomes and Brady both want to win. I think that we saw Tom Brady do that for years. To him, winning matters most. Uh, he could have been the highest-paid quarterback for many years, and he wasn't. And we talked about this on the show. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, while he's the highest-paid quarterback now, you look at the back half of that 10-year deal in five years, he's probably not going to be the highest-paid quarterback in the NFL and most likely will still be the best quarterback uh, in the NFL. Um, speaking to uh, Brady and Mahomes, first let me ask you this question. Because Tom Brady uh, restructured his deal, but he also signed a one-year extension, so he's playing at least two more years, which will get him to 45 the age that he talked about a few years ago, and a lot of people thought he was crazy. I mean, how how late, like, how long is this guy going to play for? I mean, it's crazy. And he's playing at an elite level, too. He's still arguably a top five uh, quarterback uh, in the NFL uh, and just won the Super Bowl. So, I mean, what, what, it's not like he's Vinny Testaverde in the New York Jets in his <laughs> 40s just throwing the ball out there like a mediocre quarterback. I mean, I we know that I've always felt Tom Brady gets a little bit too much credit because of the team game, but it's nonetheless really impressive he's still doing it. I mean, how long is this guy going to do it? I mean, I think he's going to do it until he loses the passion for it, which who knows, or if he if there's an injury, if he has another you know season-long injury, I think he's probably going to hang it up. But, yeah, this guy's just going to keep playing, and, I love the restructuring of the deals because the Bucks signed some players back that they needed. I mean, Shaq Barrett, uh, most notably, they need him back, and uh, they have the cap space to do it. And uh, sure enough, they're they're set. I think they also got Gronk back as well. They did. They got Gronk on a one-year deal. Also, uh, all sorts of fireworks. Again, we'll do more of a free agency special next week when it's not March Madness and. Uh, these are more agreements, as Tom said, not 100% official. But the Patriots, all of a sudden, having seen uh, Tom Brady uh, win the Super Bowl, they're making all sorts of moves, uh, dropping money left and right, uh, you know, gotten a ton of really good players. So that's interesting to see. As far as Brady, I think we've seen this. I think we've seen the modern age, how we have different medicine, different workouts, and it allows players – uh, to play longer than they have. And I think Tom Brady is going to stay in this game as long as he's elite. As long as he's a top-10 quarterback, he's going to stick around. Can I see him playing past 45? Sure. It could happen. Here's why. This guy wants all the record books. I think he really likes being the GOAT. And he wants to retire, like, not only having the most wins, not only having the most Super Bowls, 
He wants to say, oh, you think Peyton Manning is better than me in the regular season? Well, look, I have more career passing yards, more career touchdowns, more career everything. Uh, so he, he's going to keep going. Why not? He loves the game. He's still very good, and he's on a great team. He's in a great situation uh, in Tampa Bay. And uh, Tom Brady, I say this all the time, is the luckiest player in the history of the league, given that he's always been in the right situation. But he has to get some credit for that. Part of why he's always in these best situations is he's restructured his deal. He's taken less money. Uh, so he has to get credit. He's smart. He knows what he's doing. Um, my question is, I mean, do we think that his records are going to be passed by, say, Patrick Mahomes? Because, you know, if he's going to keep playing, those records are going to go keep going further. He either is first or right behind Drew Brees for most of these records. Drew Brees just retiring. Brady's going to have just about every single record in the NFL in the next two years. Do we think those records will be passed up by Mahomes or anyone else? Uh, because, I mean, I don't know how often a guy's going to play till 45. Yeah, well, I think there's a couple of different things to consider. I'm going to, to loop in another all-time great athlete into this conversation uh, about Tom Brady. Um, players like Tom Brady, players like Michael Jordan, they're a bit of egomaniacs. They're, they're really obsessed with winning, with being the best, and doing everything that they can to achieve that. Um, I think that Brady is looking, well, he's looking short, for sure, where he wants to pass Drew Brees in some of these counting stats. But he's also looking down the road, and I'm going to get a little bit more, you know, broad picture on the NFL. Uh, the NFL team owners, they want to add a 17th game to the schedule. They want to, um, they're, they're adjusting the rules that are good for quarterbacks. And, and I'm going to give credit to Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk on this one, that maybe with quarterbacks playing into their 30s really well, and maybe into their early 40s, um, you only have one quarterback on the field, and if you do a lot with the rules to keep quarterbacks relatively healthy, you can maybe look at expanding your NFL teams a little bit, you know, putting a franchise back in St. Louis perhaps, uh, putting more NFL teams. You know, what's to stop the NFL, which is by far and away the, the, the biggest national sport? It's not regional like, like baseball or even a little bit like basketball. What's to stop the NFL from expanding to 34 teams, 36, 38, 40 um, there's only one day of the week that the NFL cannot air games, and that's Friday um, due to, you know, uh, Fridays and Saturdays to avoid um, antitrust laws with college and high school football. I mean, the NFL is looking at all the money that's rolling in with gambling um, to really set up, uh, you know, games possibly on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. And if you have a lot of standalone games, that's something you can push. And they're going to help do that by keeping quarterbacks safer, better protected. And so I think Tom Brady's looking at more games in the future, more teams in the future and saying, I want to get these records now. And then years and years down the line, when somebody beats me, not because they necessarily play super long, but just because they play an extra game every single year, I, you know, people can look back at the record books and say, but Tom Brady did this when it was only 16 games. And that's a perfectly valid argument. But I think he's thinking like that far into the future if you catch my drift. I know it's a little bit out there, but um, I think that's definitely something that he's, he's being cognizant of and mindful of as he's signing these extra deals to, to keep playing. I completely agree with you, by the way, because I think a lot of these guys are – and that's what it takes to be a top-level athlete. You have to be obsessed with being the best. And I think uh, Tom Brady wants to be the best. I think he mm -hmm. desperately craves it. So that's why he's going to play. As long as he can play at an elite level, he's still going to be playing. And it's crazy because, like, to this day, his arm is still very good. If not, we haven't seen the decline that we saw with Peyton Manning and Drew Brees. Uh, I do think Patrick Mahomes is going to pass him up one day just because Patrick Mahomes is the greatest player in the history of football and one of the all-time great athletes, maybe number two behind Lionel Messi for greatest athletes of all time. Certainly in the skill sports, if we're talking all all-time, Michael Phelps, Usain Bolt might have an argument in terms of the most dominant, but um, you know we've had that discussion on this show before, and you guys know where I feel about those two. Um, but I think, I think Mahomes is, is better. He can run around more. He's got uh, even better targets. He's, he's the best. I think Mahomes uh, is also driven to be the best. So I think 
Uh, he may take advantage of the 17th game. Mm-hmm. Uh, he may take advantage of, of uh, you know, being able to play even longer. The advances in medicine and all that we're seeing and the rule changes to protect the quarterbacks. By the way, I love it. Every once in a while, we have one of these late hits, and we're upset about it in the moment. And, you know, sometimes a late hit isn't a late hit. Every once in a while, it gets pushed too far. But for the most part, the NFL protecting the quarterback is a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing because well, why do we watch sports? We watch sports for star power. And the quarterback is the most recognizable figure in America. Everyone knows who the quarterback of their team is. They may not know who the offensive lineman is. They may not even know who, who like, the point guard is in basketball or who the, the fifth hitter on their team is. But everyone knows who the quarterback is, and the league should protect their quarterbacks. Um, and I think Brady, again, has been very fortunate not to have injuries. He had one year where he missed the season. Other than that, he hasn't had injuries, and that's why uh, he's been able to play to 45. I think Mahomes passes him up. Mahomes goes down as the greatest living American athlete of all time, so look for that. Uh, but a guy that is done playing, Drew Brees. Guys, where do we think Drew Brees ranks on the all-time greats? By the way, Brees right now uh, retired second in career touchdown passes, first in career passing yards. Uh, Brady will pass him up this next season if he doesn't get hurt. Uh, Brees also first in completions, second all-time in passing yards per game, behind who else but Patrick Mahomes, uh, fifth all-time in passer rating. He's also eighth all-time in playoff passer rating. And if it wasn't for that last game he played that really brought his numbers down, he might be fifth or sixth. And of guys who have played enough games, he's definitely in the top five. I think Nick Foles is like fifth, and he's played like four or five games. So, I mean, he, he's been much better in the playoffs than people realize. Uh, it's not his fault he's played on bad teams, but – we never hear of him mention top five. Even top ten, many people don't think. I mean, is this guy top five? Is he top ten? Because uh, stats-wise, he's just as accomplished as Brady and Manning, uh, but he always gets mentioned behind those two guys, behind Aaron Rodgers, because he didn't win as many Super Bowls, even though he does have one, and because he didn't have the arm strength. But you know what? Accuracy matters as well as a quarterback. What do we think about Drew Brees on the all-time list? I know we talked about this a few months ago, but we got to talk about it now since he, he hung it up after all these years. Yeah, I mean, I'll put him in the top 10. Um, you know, something that I'm always cognizant of is, is era. And so, I mean, it was a, a couple years back when the NFL was celebrating 100 years of the league. Um, Drew Brees didn't crack the top five, uh, you know, quarterbacks. They had Brady, they had Manning. I think they had Marino, Elway, and Montana. I want to say, or no, I, I don't think they had Elway. They had somebody else who was uh, from yeah, farther United. back. Maybe. United's right. So I like it's of the modern era. Yeah, I think he's right up there. You know, probably next to Peyton Manning, maybe a little bit ahead, just because he played a little bit longer, had better numbers. Um, but it's it's it kind of comes down to Super Bowls a little bit. I mean, like, fair or not, that's what kind of differentiates. You have Peyton Manning, who won multiple MVPs. Drew Brees never won an MVP. He was really exceptionally good without ever really being the best in a given year. So uh, I, think, I think one year sure. he set the passing yards record all time, and he didn't win MVP. I mean, that's ridiculous. Who did like you know, like maybe it was like that an Adrian Peterson year or like a Chris Johnson year where he ran for two thousand yards like it could have been some weird anomaly like that that kept Drew Brees from winning an MVP. It was but Adrian Peterson year because Adrian Peterson year was Peterson and Manning um, mm. going for that award. It could have been Chris Johnson. I'm not sure. But yeah, I don't remember exactly which year that was, but. I, I, I think like it is partly narrative driven. It's the fact that, you know, he only won one Super Bowl and, you know, again, fair or not, that's part of the equation. So I think he's squarely in the top 10 of all time quarterbacks, but again, being cognizant of very, you know, Joe Montana was great for his time. Dan Marino was revolutionary. You look at, you know, Johnny Unitas was a fantastic quarterback for that era where they didn't really throw the ball a whole lot. They didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, advanced passing concepts. So, uh, I'm willing to say, you know, Drew Brees is one of the best of his time. Um, and, you know, certainly top 10 of all time in the NFL is is no slouch either. Yeah, I think you mentioned the era. It is important when, when discussing this. And Drew Brees, yeah, probably, you know, top 
three quarterback in our era or in his era, you should say. Um, but yeah, top ten overall, I think that's fair to say. You know, Breeze. You know, you just trusted him so much at the line of scrimmage to make the calls, and of course, he had a great coach in Sean Payton, but. Uh, he was just so good at no, knowing what the defense was going to do. And, yeah, he didn't have the biggest arm ever, but he was very accurate. And, you know, he had – he made wide res- some decent wide receivers into some good wide receivers, you know, like a, a Devery Henderson. Um, I can't name any others right now, but uh, he definitely – he what? Marquise Colston. Yeah, I mean, Colston as well. So um, – but yeah, you know, a a fun quarterback to watch, a guy who what? Brandon Cooks. Oh yes, Brandon Cooks as well. See, you're just naming all these random guys that he made so good or he turned so good. But uh yeah, I, I think top three in his era, top ten in the all time list is very fair. Yeah, I and mean, I think he's definitely top ten. I I, I think that if you had to put like had you know, if I had to choose, I may give Brady and Manning a fingernail. But I think that a lot of times people people say it's Brady and Manning then Breeze. I think that it should be Brady, Manning, and Breeze together. I mean, Brady, we've talked about this so many times. Played for the best defense in the NFL for so many years. His first three Super Bowls, he was essentially a game manager. I mean, Drew Brees and Peyton Manning could have won uh, those three Super Bowls with New England early on in Brady's career when he had the likes of Ted Bruschi and Ty Law uh, dominating that defense. Um, I think I think Breeze belongs in that conversation with Manning, Brady, and Rodgers, who was in that area a little bit. He may not have quite the, the talent, but I think accuracy is very underrated in the quarterback position. I mean, we had Jay Cutler in Chicago, had the best arm in the NFL, but he wasn't the best quarterback in the NFL because – I think accuracy in decision-making is ultimately a little bit more important than arm strength. And, and, you know, Breeze was a short quarterback. He didn't have that typical quarterback look and skill set, and yet he made it happen. And I think the numbers don't lie. I'm a numbers guy, and I know, Tom, you talked about only having won one Super Bowl. But, I mean, a lot of it is he played on really bad defenses and really bad run games, and the irony behind Drew Brees' career, uh, we have the Saints who finally put together a running game, finally put together a defense, and it's when Drew Brees is well past his prime. If he was Mm -hmm. playing on the Saints team we had this last season, uh, he could probably have multiple Super Bowls uh, earlier on in in his career. So I think I look at Brady, Manning, Brees, Rodgers, um, all on roughly the same level. Are they a four-way tie? Maybe. Is Brees slightly behind? Maybe. But I think he belongs in the conversation for top five. I think he belongs in the conversation for top ten. You made something interesting, Tom. You said Dan Marino was revolutionary. He was revolutionary, but he never won a Super Bowl. And I think many people will put Dan Marino ahead of Drew Brees. Uh, when Drew Brees mm-hmm. actually has a much better touchdown to interception ratio, uh, obviously – he has more yards per game because of the era, but still, like, in terms of efficiency and taking care of the ball and doing everything that it takes to be a quarterback, Marino was a little bit interception prone, as was John Elway, Brett Favre, obviously, also. So I think uh, Breeze belongs in that discussion, and I think much like I talked about in the NBA, I think you look at the NBA, the second-best player and the eighth-best player, very little gap. Same thing for NFL. We look at the second best quarterback and the ninth greatest quarterback ever, about the same. So I don't like this idea that Brady and Manning were so far ahead of Breeze when in reality he was right there with them. He just didn't get the notoriety because he wasn't constantly playing in the conference championship game. And partly because they were in the same conference that almost built Brady and Manning's names up Mm -hmm. even bigger because we saw them play each other so many times where we didn't see Drew Brees do that. Drew Brees, by the way, though, has a winning record all time against Tom Brady head-to-head, and Drew Brees beat Peyton Manning in the Super Bowl. So a couple of things to think about when you're underrating Drew Brees. I, I say this, the most underrated player in NFL history is Drew Brees. 
most underrated player in NBA history, Dwayne Wade. Those are two of the guys that I personally have always been a big fan of. Yeah, and they'll get their due, uh, you know, five years after they retire. I think both of them are going to be first ballot Hall of Famers. So uh, certainly uh, won't be disrespected for very long, I don't think. Still, no. Won't go as high as they can. <laughs> no, not really. Anyways, moving on. Locks of the week. Drew Brackett has retaken a one-game lead against me, uh, is now in first place. Tom Castleman still... Uh, way in the back over there in third place. Uh, two in one week for Drew. Uh, he desperately, completely missed his NHL money line pick. Uh, I think he had the Ducks over the Kings. 5-1 Kings. That one did not go well. But, of course, he got the under in English Premier League soccer. We knew that was going to happen. Austin Villa and Newcastle United. Under two and a half goals went 1-1. One, one. And he got the under in the Championship League, England's second division of soccer. He had, he had under two and a half goals again. Brentford and Blackburn, uh, one zero was that final. It was a goal early in the game. I was tracking it online just to see how Drew would do. And ten minutes in, it was one zero. And I was like, wow, he might actually miss this. And the rest of the eighty minutes, no goals whatsoever. So <laughs> that got got that cover easily. Uh, Tom Castleman uh, went for an interesting mix in that BYU-Gonzaga game. Uh, he had Gonzaga minus one, eight and a half in the first half. Uh, he was wrong. They were actually down 12 at the half. Mm-hmm. Came back to win by 10, uh, but BYU covered 14 and a half. And he had Josh Richardson of the Mavs over 12 and a half points. In typical Castleman prop fashion, he had 12 points. He needed one more, one more point. Last seven minutes of the game, didn't score at all. I think he had maybe mm-hmm. one field goal attempt. Uh, so didn't look for the ball late in the game there to get you that cover. Um, meanwhile, I had Gonzaga covering uh, 14 and a half uh, against BYU. I missed that one. I had Barcelona, PSG over three and a half goals. It was 1-1 early, had a penalty kick late in the first half, looked like we were going to get the three goals at halftime. The penalty kick was missed by the greatest of all time, Lionel Messi, leaving me in tears for the rest of the day. Uh, and it ended in a 1-1 draw, so I did not get the over goals there. I did, however, get the Mavericks covering four and a half over the Spurs. They won by 11. Uh, this week, I'm going all college basketball in honor of the tournament. But we're going to start with Tom Castleman. You know what? Let's start with Drew Brackett because he's going to be short and sweet. Let's start with Drew first. What do you Yeah, got? yeah tonight, a game in progress. Just kidding. Uh, tonight, NBA, a late game tonight. Uh, the Timberwolves over the Lakers, uh, seven-and-a-half-point underdogs of the T-Wolves. Take that. Uh, it's going to be close against the Lake Show tonight. Tomorrow, the Wizards minus three over the Kings in the NBA, and then tomorrow to the NHL, I'll take the Flames over the Oilers. Uh, the Flames, you can get it at, like, minus 115. Okay. The money line. Yeah. I'm, so no English Premier League under this week. What happened? No, no, no. Just, uh, you know, going the conventional sports this week. Just going to try and see how I do. Maybe maybe yeah. give you guys a gift. Who knows? <laughs> You're definitely giving us a gift because we know you could get at least one win had you gone English Premier League under. This could be an 0-3 week for you, Drew. Could be. Could be. Oh, I like that Wizards pick, but I'm going to tell you I like it so I can jinx it. So Of course. Man, that's... now I might have to flip it. But, no, I'm going to stick with the Wizards. My history. Yeah, that's a good pick. The Kings are really struggling mightily this year. And they should be better than they are. De'Aaron Fox, Buddy Heald, uh, they have some young talent, but really struggling in San Francisco. Marvin Bagley certainly hasn't worked out for Vladi Divac with that pick. Uh, Tom, what do you got? I think Tom and I are both doing March Madness this week. Drew is not to the trend in honor of the tournament, so but that's okay. Yeah, I like uh, going with themes on sporting on big sporting events as, uh, as they're taking place. So uh, we'll see how it goes here. This, I think this is my only my second foray into uh, looking at college basketball games. I'm going to start with 
a lock-in uh, play-in game this uh, this week coming up on uh, Thursday. The line has moved a bit at one point. The Drexel Bulldogs were plus 105 on the money line, I figured. It's only one and a half point. Go for that. Drake, the, the, Drake. The, Drake, I said Drexel. I you did. I knew that was going to happen. He doesn't even know what he's picking. <laughs> I have it. I have Drexel at one point in my notes and Drake later on in my notes. So that is definitely on me. I'm not picking Drexel to cover anything against Illinois. I don't trust 16s and ones, but I will take Drake over Wichita State. Right now, it is at a pick'em, so the value is gone. But I like the Bulldogs in that one. I think that the North Carolina Tar Heels are playing at a better level than the Wisconsin Badgers. So on Friday, I'll take the Tar Heels to cover just minus one and a half against the Badgers in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And then I have any number of things that I can go to, but I'm going to go with a little bit of a popular Cinderella pick. Uh, Jay Billis has been on this one. I've heard of a couple other places as well. The Ohio Bobcats going up against the Virginia Cavaliers in the 4-13 and 13 matchup. Uh, I'm only going to pick Ohio to cover the 7.5. Uh, Ohio... Uh, played Illinois close earlier this year, losing to the Illini by just two points. Uh, they've got a great player. Kama, we talked earlier about looking at for superstars in the NCAA tournament. Jason Preston averages 16 points, seven assists, seven rebounds per game. Uh, they have a really good offense for Ohio. Uh, Virginia, we talked about they had to re- uh, withdraw from the ACC tournament due to a COVID issue, so we don't know exactly what their availability is going to be. And they're actually arriving in Indiana, I believe, on Friday. So we've got a lot of moving parts there. Uh, so I'm going to go with Ohio. Virginia, not as great on defense as they have been in the past. So Ohio could end up being an upset pick. I'm not confident enough on that, but I think they'll keep it closer to 7.5, especially when you consider Virginia plays at such a slow pace. Uh, not nearly as many possessions uh, to go around. So I don't think they're going to build up that big of a lead on the Bobcats. Yeah. So interesting. Uh, Jay Billis, by the way, has Ohio in his Sweet 16. That's mm-hmm. enough. That's number 13 seed. Uh, Jay Billis, too cool to follow anyone on Twitter. We'll see how cool he is with his picks. I think I've beaten him almost every single season. I always track <laughs> Jay Billis' bracket is in mine. I think I beat him like three of the last four years. Uh, I think I had three years in a row where I beat him. Last last tournament, he did beat me. I had a bad bracket last tournament, which was two years ago. I, did, I didn't know you had a vendetta against Jay Billis. <laughs> I don't like that he doesn't follow anyone back on Twitter. It's like, really? Are you that cool to not follow anyone on Twitter? It's just very random. Does he literally have zero follow or, or zero follows? Yeah, he used I got to look this up now. He doesn't follow anyone. I'm I don't like, think he follows anybody. I'm like, are you too cool, bro? Like, I mean, come on. So, yeah. That is so after hilarious. That, uh, after that, like, I don't know. I played this Castleman. Jay Billis, since he's the big expert, I tracked my bracket, and I have beaten him most years in the bracket challenge. So I don't, don't look for Ohio to do well because Jay Billis said it. So, uh, But nonetheless, um, I'm going with a very, very similar theme to you. In fact, our picks are eerily similar, and our theme is the exact same. We do have one pick that's the same, but I'm going to save that one for last. Okay. So uh, you went for almost sort of a pick em game in uh, the first four. I'm going the same route, Michigan State and UCLA. I got Michigan State uh, minus two. I talked about them earlier uh, in the program in the last few weeks. Um, this Michigan team beat uh, – Michigan State team, rather, beat Michigan, Illinois, Ohio State, uh, which are all one or two seeds in this tournament. Uh, Tom Izzo uh, always delivers in March. His teams always tend to overachieve. In fact, they choke when they're a high seed. There were one, there were two seed a few years back, lost the 15 seed in Middle Tennessee, but they made the Final Four as a seven seed, uh, made the four, Final Four twice as a five seed. So they tend to do better uh, when they're a little bit lower, uh, and I think they have a lot to prove. I think Michigan State covers. Uh, minus two over a UCLA team that uh, has really struggled down the stretch. Just horrible basketball late in the season by the Bruins. Uh, that's why they found themselves as an 11th seed in the playing game. Maybe three, four weeks ago, we were looking at 
UCLA on the 5-6 line, so they're really trending downwards. Um, I'm going to 12-5. I think you went 13-4 where a line was 7.5. Uh, you're not quite sure whether to pick the upset or not, but you like the line. I like Oregon State at plus 7.5. In fact, I am picking the upset outright in my bracket, but not feeling as confident on the money line to give you the odds. So take the 7.5. Uh, Tennessee is one of the most inconsistent and bipolar teams in the history of college basketball. Uh, they've, look, they've got two guys on their team that might be NBA players, but they play a, a slower tempo. I don't know what they're doing. Rick Barnes over there, uh, Kim English, Mizzou's former player, the assistant coach. Uh, they just haven't gotten this Tennessee team uh, to buy in consistently. Uh, so really inconsistent team. Uh, Oregon State, one of the hottest teams in the country, uh, they just won the Pac-12 uh, conference tournament again in the NCAA tournament. Uh, they've won six out of seven games altogether, uh, and they beat UCLA, Oregon, and Colorado, three of the top four teams in that conference on their way to making the tournament. So give me Oregon State plus seven and a half against Rocky Top. And then finally, uh, this is the game that I do agree with Tom, uh, UNC minus one and a half over Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin is playing dreadful basketball lately, having lost four of the last five. Meanwhile, UNC had won three in a row prior to a close three-point loss to Florida State in the ACC semis. Uh, they played really well down the stretch. About a month ago, we were talking about is UNC on the bubble, and just last night, they get an eight seed, and we have Bracket Joe Lenardi saying that they probably should have been seeded better as a seven or a six. So look for the Tar Heels to uh, dominate the Wisconsin Badgers, who you would think would be good in the tournament because they have all these guys who are 22, 23 years old. But if you've watched Wisconsin basketball, which I've watched a surprisingly high amount of Wisconsin basketball this year, I haven't watched as much college hoops as I normally do, but I've tried to watch some of the top teams, and it seems like every time Michigan or Illinois or one of these top Big Ten teams is playing and they're on TV, they're always playing Wisconsin. And every time I watch, I'm very underwhelmed by Wisconsin. And every time they're in a close game, you're like, oh, these seniors will come up clutch. And what happens? They lose all of them. So UNC should cover easily against Wisconsin. Or if it's close, we know Wisconsin will choke when it's close. So there you have it. Should be fun doubling up the stakes on, on not only the brackets, but the locks of the week as well. Uh, statement salutes. What do you guys have uh, this week? Well, I must say it, it's finally uh, here, March Madness. After last year, we obviously didn't have it, but uh, this is the one time a year where folks tune into True TV. It's a thing now, uh, <laughs> unless you wa- unless you watch Impractical Jokers. Uh, that's also on True TV. But so yeah, we'll rediscover True TV. At least the folks who don't watch Impractical Impractical Jokers. Uh, but something really cool going on on the women's side of things. Uh, traditionally, ESPN has just kind of done a a look around uh, on every game. They don't really have. It's not like the men where they have an indi- individual channel for each game. Well, this year that is changing. They're going to be, each game will be on uh, the ESPN family of networks. So you'll have ABC, ESPN, ESPN2, and ESPNU all showing women's basketball games in full in the NCAA tournament. So we'll have both the men and the women all games in full on TV. It's going to be awesome. Fantastic. I did not know that. Real quick, um, uh, what do we think about uh, the women's uh, bracket? I just filled out my women's bracket uh, last night. Um, do we think UConn's going to win it all? Is it going to be Stanford? I think South Carolina in the mix. Uh, Paige, uh, that star player on UConn, star freshman. Uh, I think one of the few or the first time an All-American, first team All-American as a freshman out of UConn. I like uh, UConn to win the women's tournament. Gino Ariyama is sidelined until at least the Sweet 16 because of COVID, but I don't think they're going to have any issues in, 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 uh, early in the tournament. Certainly the women's tournament, if you follow it, which I do watch it actually, has very much less upsets than the men's tournament, 
It tends the one, two seeds almost always are the final four. You don't see like a four or five get in there very often. Uh, what do you, do you guys have a team you like? Because I like UConn. They haven't I'm, won, must, by the way. Yeah, I know. I must say this year I know there's always been, you know, one to two teams that we think are going to win. But I think there's nine or ten teams that can win. We may see a three seed in the final four this year. Um, and it just shows there's a lot of parity in women's basketball this season. NC State is, I think they're the number one overall seed. Um, if I was watching the reveal last night, they were the first team revealed, so I assume. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think it's wide open this year, whereas in previous years we had a pretty good thought of who was going to win. For the record, I do have all one and two seeds in my Elite Eight. And my- I, I figured you did. That's why I said it, because uh, I, I think this year is going to be a little different. And it's not because of the COVID. It's just the more balanced, I think, uh, you know, from seeds one through three. You know what UConn women's basketball reminds me of? Um, Mm. It kind of reminds me of Team USA basketball and the 92 Dream Team. It used to be that the 92 Dream Team was so much better than everyone else. And the rest of the world, obviously USA is still the best, but the rest of the world is caught up in basketball. We had the team in 04 where America didn't send their best players and they got bronze in the Olympics. Manu Ginobili, Andres Nocioni, former Bull legend, and Argentina knocking off USA in the semifinals, um, and then USA beat Lithuania in the bronze medal game. Uh, it's kind of the same thing in women's basketball. We had a stretch there for about 10 or 15 years. UConn was so dominant, so much better than everyone else, but now people have caught up and UConn isn't a lock to win the tournament, but I think this freshman, number five, Paige, I don't want to pronounce her name wrong. I've watched her a little bit on TV. She's a phenomenon, and she's literally one of the best players they've had in the likes of a Diana Taurasi and a Sue Bird, uh, Maya Moore, uh, that, type of, that type of build. So I like UConn in the women's tournament. That is awesome to hear, though, Drew, because I remember they do that turnaround because I used to watch – look for the Mizzou women's tournament games on TV, and you didn't know that they'd always be on there. Of course, Mizzou isn't in the tournament this season. Uh, Second year without Sophie Cunningham went a little bit better than year one, but not quite good enough uh, to make uh, March Madness. But hopeful for Asia Blackwell, Haley Frank, and the rest of those players that will all of a sudden be juniors uh, next year. And True TV, by the way, uh, I do watch... uh, what is the sh- what is it called again? Impractical Jokers. I watched that show. It's pretty funny. I used to watch it when they had a parody uh, about local TV. They did like a story where they did a parody uh, at the local TV station, like in Greenwood or something, like like market like 180 something. And having worked in like a small market uh, TV station myself, I found that show to be phenomenal. So. They have done some good stuff on True TV. Maybe we should start paying more attention besides during the tournament. Maybe so. Tom, what do you got for us? Uh, so first off, I'm going to start with a quick salute. Uh, Lisa Byington is the first woman to call play-by-play for the men's tournament uh, in the history of the men's tournament. So congratulations to her. And here's to hoping that uh, we're close to a point where hearing a woman's voice on the call is, not, is no longer going to be ear-catching, that it will become just a regular uh, uh, part of the uh, announcement, uh, the broadcast team rotations. So uh, she's definitely breaking a barrier, and she's uh, you know wrote a blog on her own website uh, about that experience and you know her experience to this point. So congratulations to her. Uh, looking forward to hearing her call and everybody's call uh, on the tournament games. Uh, this upcoming uh, couple of weeks. Uh, for my statement of the week, uh, what if I told you, going ESPN 30 for 30 style here, that an NCAA team won every single game of their season, similar to Gonzaga, winning conference regular season and the t- uh, their, their tournament title, and was not going to the big dance? Seems pretty ridiculous because it is. I'm talking, of course, about California Baptist women's basketball team. The Lancers are in year three of a four-year reclassification window that the NCAA imposes on teams that are moving from Division II to Division I. So what is the reason for this window? It's to make sure that schools and athletes meet standards of, and, in athletics and academics for the NCAA. It's kind of sort of bogus in my opinion, 
but it's basically just to make sure that they're on the level playing field with everybody else. Uh, as you probably well know, I've never really been a fan of the NCAA as an organization. I think that they are unethical grifters, a bureaucratic waste of time and energy uh, that focus a lot more on slapping down schools for misproprieties in money or academics and being completely toothless when it comes to much bigger issues as we see with Title IX and a lot of some of the abuse scandals that we've seen over many, many years. I think that if the NCAA is going to impose these standards on schools trying to reclassify from Division II to Division I, uh, they should make the schools do that before, uh, you know, make the schools qualify before taking their money for being part of Division I uh, NCAA that the teams uh, and schools prove it so that when they are joining the Division I ranks, their players are immediately eligible for postseason play so that when they have great seasons like this, I think they want, what, like 26-0, something like that, that they actually have a chance, that the players have a chance to play for a national championship. And it's just really unfortunate that they were so good this year and are denied that chance because of just some bureaucratic red tape. Wow. Wow. I completely missed that. And that's literally mm -hmm. unbelievable. You go undefeated and you don't get to play in the tournament. Yeah, they're not eligible. Did they play in the conference tournament? Yeah, yeah. They were able to do all their conference stuff. It's just for the overarching NCAA. They are not able to compete for, for postseason titles. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, Tom. That's, I mean, that's sad. That's pathetic. Yeah, I mean, the NCAA does not get a lot of things right in this right. just the latest a latest uh, issue that they have definitely gotten wrong. Uh, another one that I think they've gotten wrong is is and so far we have been fortunate, you know, unless there's breaking news or something, but I believe every team that qualified for the tournament as of right now, which is seven nineteen, Tuesday, March sixteenth, uh, Chicago, Illinois time that everyone is going to play their opening round game. We haven't had any breaking news of that? Uh, as far as I can tell, no. I'll do another refresh on the old Twitter machine, get off of Jay Billis's page here, seeing he has no followers. But uh, I don't see any sort of breaking news. Anyone. Yeah. Or, yeah, he doesn't – yeah, he, you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, Jay, uh, I'm Jay Billis. No, I don't, I don't mean to poke fun of Jay. He has, he has a right not to follow anyone. But, uh, anyways – uh, my statement of the week is that it is absolutely ridiculous and unfair for there to be a scenario where a team does not get to play in the NCAA tournament because of COVID. Can you imagine a senior player who's made the tournament for the first time, a team that's earned a tournament spot, uh, or even perhaps can you imagine one of the power teams, a team that has a chance to win the national championship, and they're told, you're knocked out of the tournament. We're going to replace you with uh, St. Louis, Ole Miss, or one of those teams that they have. And, and, and what I don't understand is how is that even going to work? Do you re slot in a replacement team as a three or four seed when it's a team that didn't even deserve to make the tournament? It's all sorts of a mess. And we may get lucky where we completely avoid the situation, but this is what the NCAA tournament should have done from the start. They should have given these teams who made the NCAA tournament, have them quarantine for a week. Have them go to their location, because these teams are coming from conference tournaments all over the country. They're coming from all over the country, and they could have a test because they're simply traveling, and it may not be the athlete's fault. We know this virus, you can catch it in very random ways. There are people who legitimately try to prevent the virus from getting them that end up getting it. It's just the way the virus works. And I'm not saying that we need to allow players to play with COVID. No, it's a big tournament. There's a lot of teams. I understand the dangers of it. So what I'm proposing is for them to push back the tournament a week to make sure that everyone uh, is quarantined together. They've passed all their tests so we don't have this issue. In addition, if this happens later in the tournament, we should postpone. Even if it's just one team, I would rather postpone the tournament than have these kids miss out on opportunity to win the tournament game, to win the tournament itself. Can you imagine if Gonzaga has a positive test in the second round of the tournament? We're going to boot out 
the best team in the country that's undefeated, looking to go undefeated for the first time since 1976. No, we cannot have that happen. So I think that every team that's in the tournament should play every game. If that means postponing the tournament into June, it can get postponed as late as it has to. But I want every game to be played. I don't want any of these kids to miss a chance uh, for the tournament because of COVID. We saw many of them miss it last year. Really crazy story, San Diego State Aztecs, while I had them getting upset against Syracuse, uh, this is a team that was like a two seed last year in the tournament. They lost three seniors, one of them to the NBA. Uh, that was a team that could have made a tournament run last year, didn't get a chance to do it. Can you imagine if they get COVID this year, they're like, oh, you're not in again, you know? So uh, I, 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 I just think that, that um, there's never a perfect situation with this virus and sports. There's nothing that is going to be perfect. There's always going to be a risk-reward. There's always going to be one side that goes one way, one side that goes the other way. But I think to me it's important, two things are important with the NCAA tournament. One, that the kids stay safe. Two, that they get to experience the NCAA tournament. So if that means pushing back games, postponing games, sign me up. We'll call it April Madness. I'm fine with it. I just want to make sure that everyone gets to play uh, their games. Also, it, it's, a, it's an advantage thing. Can you imagine if a team gets a bye, much like Texas did in the, in the Big 12 tournament? They had a bye against Kansas, made the game easier uh, against um, Oklahoma State in the championship game. So I don't think some of these teams should be getting buys, um, and it's just not fair. So there's not a perfect solution that I have, but I would say postpone, 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 because I don't want to see any of these replacement teams anywhere near the tournament. I want who's in the tournament to play their game no matter when it happens or how long it happens. Well, I think that since we're past the deadline, we're not going to have replacement teams after this point. I think that if, if a team does have uh, a, a COVID outbreak, uh, that they will be, uh, they'll have to forfeit. I mean, the NCAA has done a pretty, I think a pretty fair job of saying that, um, all you need to be eligible is five players. So as long as you have five players that, you know, are not out due to either having a COVID positive test or, you know, being a close contact as they do the contact tracing, um, as long as you can put five people on the court, you can still play. Um, but at this point with uh, no replacement teams in, with nobody uh, backing out due to COVID, if a team is not able to, to, to get on the floor, it's simply a no contest, like you said, and, and, and the uh, opposing team advances. So, uh, hopefully that won't be the case. The NCAA has already sent home six officials, six referees uh, who uh, had COVID, um, or at least were close contacts for COVID. Um, so, I mean, they're they're on top of it, but I think this is just going to end up being one of those things where it's like, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a what a shame year for for teams, and I really really hope that we don't have that. Well, and you did mention the five players. I did actually see that, but I mean, can mm -hmm. you imagine? If like Gonzaga has like Jalen Suggs, yeah, Bert and Timmy all go down. It's like yeah, Gonzaga without their three best players. So and then like, we know how this virus spreads. It may be one person, but it could be like six or seven people get hit. And even mm -hmm. getting to five players, that's pretty unfair. I, I don't know. Like again, it's not. It's a very unfair situation. It's not a perfect situation. And here's to no teams having any COVID and us not this us this not being an issue. Interesting. Once they get to the Elite Eight, all the games are in one location, in Indianapolis. So the first couple rounds is where we could have issues. But mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we don't, and we saw that in the NFL, NBA. Things, for the most part, went smoothly in the playoffs. So I'm hoping this doesn't become an issue. But in the event that it yeah. does, I personally think we should do everything we can to give everyone a chance to play. Uh, and if it means postponing, it means postponing. Which is, by the way, what I thought about high school sports. I get it. Like, when high school sports got canceled, I was covering sports in Missouri. I thought that they should have gotten canceled given, given mm -hmm. the virus. But, like, we had basketball where we had teams in the state semifinals. I, I didn't feel it being wrong for them to play the state championship in the summer, just those kids that were available. That's what I would have loved to see as opposed to canceling it all together. I'm right. not a 
bit, but I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's all complicated, but I'm just hoping that we get to see all the players, all the games, so that we get this awesome tournament that we love. For sure. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, first four games are starting on Thursday evening this week, 5 o'clock uh, Eastern, 4 Central. And uh, then, yeah, everything starts in earnest with the round of 64 on Friday and Saturday. So it'll be a lot of fun. I think we'll be uh, pretty well glued to the TV, I think it's safe to say. Can't yeah. wait. Can't wait. Well, that does it for Salute Your Sports uh, Week 23. Uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be talking uh, March Madness Week 16. We'll see how everyone's picks look. Have a great day, everyone.